Today's episode is brought to you by EliteFTS.com. Founded in 1998 with the primary aim to live, learn, and pass on. Please help Elite FTS support this mission by smashing the like button, leaving a comment, sharing with a friend, and thinking of us for your training needs. If you can put it in a gym bag or load weights on it, Elite FTS has it. What's going on? I'm Dave Tate. We are broadcasting from the middle of the Elite FTS weight room, where the underground still thrives and you're part of the crew. It's time to sit down, keep it real, and cut the bullshit. Welcome to Table Talk. What's going on, guys? We're back with another episode of Table Talk. Today, my guest is Joey Smith. Before getting into introducing him, I want to remind you guys that the Swiss Super Early Bird deadline is today. So click the link in the description to sign up for Swiss and save $290, I believe is what the saving is now. The symposium is in October, and it's one of the biggest events of the year as far as networking, strength training, and the medical profession basically what swiss is to make it very very condensed is we're taking people or ken kanakin started swiss to take people from multiple facets that all are around the strength industry from medical professionals to powerlifters to bodybuilders to physical therapists to put them all in one clinic and then let them do their let them do their stuff to be able to help everybody get better across the board and learn from each other. So that is the Swiss Symposium. Again, the link is in the description. $290 off. Sign today. Or sign up today. Okay, getting to Joey here. And Joey's been with Team Elite FTS since 2005. No, started competing in 2005. And been with Elite FTS since 2007. And has seen the growth the changes in the company throughout the years, changes in other lifters throughout the years. You founded and owned Nebo Barbell. When you came on, you didn't have Nebo Barbell, mm -hmm. so it went from just you know regular lifter to a lift uh, to a coach lifter with hundreds of athletes that you've probably worked with, which we'll talk about. So there's a lot of shit to talk about throughout all this that I want to be able to tap into. But before we get into that, the one thing I want to talk about is this video here. I guess I'm the only true fat ass left. Everybody's turned into Oprah Winfrey. Lose weight, I'm coming get down. fat. Lose weight, <laughs> get fat. Here, Lose weight, get fat. <laughs> Fuck that, I'm staying fat. That was, that was at one of our events. I don't know, remember which one it was, but you you were being you like i don't want to say frustrated you're just, just observing like all, <laughs> like all these guys man they gain weight they lose weight they gain weight they lose weight and it was myself and Desenzio, uh probably mark barley there's a whole bunch of people yeah. the whole time and you're like screw it i'm just gonna stay fat i'm just gonna stay big but then i'm going through your instagram a few weeks ago and i see you standing there and you got fucking vein in your bicep and abs and i'm thinking motherfucker like what yep. the hell yep. there's no way i'm gonna have you on the podcast and not bust your balls for that so what's up with that so uh, uh probably about 18 months back um like you and i were speaking before the before we started on the podcast i could just tell something in my health wasn't right i wasn't feeling right i was tired all the time i was feeling lethargic i just wasn't feeling myself um my wife's a nurse and she just kept pressing me look you need to go get some blood work done i'm your typical dumbass male that you know, doesn't want to go to the doctor. I don't want to go get seen. I don't want to have my blood drawn. I can fix this. So we finally went and um, did all the blood work, and I explained to the doc what was going on with me, what I was trying to do. A few days later, maybe four or five days later, all the blood work is back. And uh, she calls me while we're at the gym, and uh, she's like, is your wife around? Because she knows Melissa's a nurse. And she's like, you're not going to understand all this stuff, so I need her present. So I put her on the speakerphone, and s several of the people from the gym are standing there as well, and she's reading off all these numbers that don't mean anything to me because I don't know what any of this shit means. And she's like, you know, for instance, like my hemoglobin's like 21.5 or something like that. And I look at Melissa, and I'm like, is that bad? And I could just see the serious look on her face. So she kept rolling with the numbers and rolling with the numbers, kidneys and your cholesterol and you're good and you're bad and 
all these other things, and they were all fucking terrible. And uh, I was weighing like 312 at the time, and uh, she was like, you've got to do something now. Like, now. You're not going to make it. And I'm like, really? So, of course, you know, I get the eye from Melissa. You know, she's like, you know, I know that you like being this size, but we've got to do something. So the first thing that I went and done that I've never done in my life was give blood because that was the first thing that the doctor recommended. She said, this will get your numbers down temporarily for mm -hmm. right now. And I didn't realize that when you go to have your uh, blood taken that they check your hemoglobin beforehand and there's a certain number that it can't be. Well, I was 0.1 from being that number that I couldn't give blood. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was like, well, you're lucky. And I was like, yeah, I guess I am. You know, I didn't say anything to these people. Gave blood. And um, I, honestly, I could tell a difference in how I felt a couple of days later. i never given blood. I'm, I'm a pussy. I don't like needles. I don't like seeing my blood. I don't like any of that shit. And um, <clears throat> for me to get started, I knew that I needed to get my diet right. You know, we're power lifters. We think that just we can just eat pop tarts and Debbie cakes and drink beer and eat cereal and live off peanut butter and you know sort of eat chicken every once in a while and think we're eating properly, you know eat a steak here and there. I'm eating good. Yeah. No, you're not. So that was the difficult thing. We have cabinets full of shit, you know Oreos and cookies and cereal and I was drinking five gallons of milk a week, you know because I love some milk. So, Melissa started depleting. Those things started disappearing. I guess they went in the trash because I couldn't find them. <laughs> I have these problems of getting up when I know shit is in the house at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. She calls it my eating sleepwalking problem. Mm -hmm. And I don't even remember going in there. And she knows because I'll leave a trail of food or crumbs or something all over the damn counter. Um. So I called a friend of mine, and I'll give a shout out to him, Bobby Betts. Um, Bobby is an up and coming bodybuilder. Um, he used to be the IPA chairman in Tennessee. We got affiliated with him through a lot of meets, which he ran some of the best powerlifting meets that I've ever seen in my career that I've been to. But, anyways, um, I needed something to hold me accountable because, you know, it sounds easy just stopping. But I needed to be financially dedicated to stopping. Mm -hmm. So um, he devises a plan, and um, this is what it's going to cost. You do weekly check-ins and videos and pictures and weigh-ins. You know, it's pretty evasive. I need to see this. I need to see that. I need to see this. So the first couple of months was crazy difficult for me because I'm used to eating pretty much whatever I want. And uh, it probably saved a ton of money on the grocery bill at that time because we weren't buying all this shit anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, what he did was, um, you know, you know how this works because you've done it. Mm -hmm. But he increased my eating load of what I was doing, like, um, just say like five meals a day. Small meals, but, you know, weighed out, calculated, measured, you know. Um, so it was no more cereal, no more pop tarts, no more ice cream, no more sweet tea, no more Kool-Aid, straight water, unless I wanted to put some flavor additive in it. Um, no salt, no sugar. Um, and it was a radical change for me and I hated every fucking minute of it. So I probably did this with him for about four months and I needed that first four months to get myself through it. Like, okay, I'm good now. I can do the rest of this on my own. So Melissa, she does all the cooking. She is absolutely the most fantastic cook in the world. She loves to cook. So it made my life easier because she did all the meal preps. You know, she loves doing that stuff and she does it for herself. So she kind of put herself into a, a diet mode as well because I was doing it. So she was making similar to what I was making, you know, not that she needed to lose weight, but she knew she needed to be a little healthier too. And probably by my sixth month, I was looking at these pictures, you know, that I was sending Bobby and comparing them. And I was like, wow, I'm really losing some fucking weight, you know, the right way. 
I wasn't starving myself. You know how this works. Mm -hmm. That's not how you do that. And at my age, you got to get that metabolism speed sped back up. And that's what was happening. And I was losing weight pretty quick. So I've lost, you know, right at 40 pounds in 14 months. And that's dramatic for me. You know, I mean, I haven't weighed what I'm weighing currently in 20 years. Well, I was going to say the, the first meet that I saw in open powerlifting, you competed in the 275s. Yes. But see what powerlifting, open powerlifting doesn't have on there. And that's, yeah, yeah, that's true. Th there's a lot of things that I was doing beforehand because yeah. there was not federations in North Carolina mm -hmm. to lift in. So when was your first meet? Um, I was 20 years old and it was at a armory in Asheville. There was, okay. it was a bench only meet. Um, there was a lot of meets that I was doing with guys that just were at local gyms, at high schools, at public gyms, at yeah. National Guard armories. Yeah, I know. <clears throat> but we, you know, during those years in the late 1990s, there was no IPA, APF, SPF. There was nothing in North Carolina at all. No yeah. sanctioned federations to lift in. Well, even some of them that were sanctioned, if they didn't send them into powerlifting USA, they never I didn't know about them. Yeah, because, nobody knew. You know, we yeah. existed without internet during those days. You understand? <laughs> yeah, yeah, this. yeah. So we had a magazine to read once a month to have to know part yeah. of what's going on in the world, and then we would have to wait six fucking months just to know what weight class our rankings were in. You know, because it was so divided out, yeah. if not longer, if not longer. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> but. Um, you want me to go back to the diet or the... Yeah, the diet. Okay. So, um, I'm not going to lie. I was looking at some of these pictures and I was, you know, I was sort of proud of myself because, you know, this is something... I mean, it's hard to do that. It's hard to dial back what you're used to doing and justifying it by, I'm a power lifter. Mm -hmm. I can eat what I want and I'm going to be okay. You know, the bigger I am, the stronger I'm going to be, and blah, blah, blah. Bigger the casket. Yeah, the bigger the casket. That's exactly right. <laughs> but, you know, I may get a little mushy right here about this, but I love my wife, and I love my daughter, and I want to be around a little bit longer. This is a part of my life, what I do, lifting. Um, but there's going to be a time to where I'm not doing this the way I'm doing it. You know, I'm still an active, competing power lifter at the age of 49, um, I still have some things left in the tank, but you know, there's going to be a day when this is over with and I want to be able to live to see those days. So I had to make a very serious conscious effort to, to do this. Now, with that being said, I hate every fucking minute of it. It's like you and I talked about before we were laughing about it. I hate being this size. I do. I fucking hate it. I don't like being this size. I feel like I'm small. I feel like I'm, um, Half the man that I used to be, you know, uh, we laughed about it earlier. I was telling him we had to buy a whole new wardrobe for me. Yeah, you know, I'm serious. And no. I, I'm, I'm, I'm like you. I wear T-shirts and mm -hmm. shorts and, you know, when you go shopping with your wife, shit changes all of a sudden. This pink shirt would look nice on you. This dress shirt would look nice on you. So it, somehow I'm deviating from a, wearing just black T-shirts all the time to now I've got dress clothes. And then I'm buying dress pants and then I'm buying khaki shorts. You know, she's laughing. I know she is over there, but it's true. We started buying myself clothes that I don't normally wear um, because I couldn't fit in them. Yeah. You know, and now I can. And she's like, yay, now I can dress him up, <laughs> take him out and look clean. Um, but I had to give all my clothes away at the gym because I couldn't wear anything. I didn't, I'm not one of these guys that like to wear 3X shirts, which I wore them when I was 300 pounds because I had to because I was a fat ass. But at this size, I look like a bag lady. You know, mm -hmm. every, you know what I'm saying? Everything just hanging off of me. And so I didn't want that. Um, but anyways, after I cut off with Bobby and I was like, look, I think I can do this now. We continued on. I stayed on track. I didn't deviate. Um, I had like one cheat meal a week that he gave me. Um, and we stuck to that and it was on Saturdays and trust me, when I had that cheat meal, I cheated it up, mm -hmm. you know, and I have stayed consistent with this. And if it wasn't for what Melissa does, I don't know if I could, I hate being in the kitchen. I hate cooking. I hate, you know, doing those type of things. And she's made my life 10 times easier by helping me with it. And that helps. So between Bobby and between Melissa, 
I couldn't have done it without them. Could I have? Yes, but you know how it is when you don't really want to do something, but when you have that little push and help, it helps things a lot easier to be done. And I look back on it and there's the plus side. Yes, I'm healthier than I was. Am I still like the healthiest person in the world? No, I'm way healthier than I was. I've lost almost right at 40 pounds. Um, all of my numbers have came down, ex extremely came down. You know, I feel better. Um, I sleep better. I still have a CPAP. I've had a CPAP since 2000. Um, and that's something that I cannot function without. I mm -hmm. can't take a nap without it. I, you know, people are like, man, I'm gonna take me an hour nap. Well, I've got to have my machine to do that. You understand? Oh that. yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so I still have my CPAP. I still have sleep apnea. You know, that hasn't changed. Um, but my quality of life and how I feel, I really didn't know if it was just a placebo effect of what was going on or if this is really, but I do. I feel the best I've ever felt in my life. And there's other aspects that changed. You fully understand this. You and I have had surgeries. Now, you've had some serious replacement shit. I have not yet. But my body doesn't hurt as much because I'm not as big and I'm not carrying all that weight. Um, I don't feel like I'm going to die when I walk up steps. And probably the most mind-blowing thing is I can bend over and tie my shoes without feeling like I'm about to fucking pass out. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. I had, I can't even believe I'm going to tell you this, but it got so bad. I bought this thing on Amazon and you would slide your socks over this device and it had a rope on each side of it. Mm -hmm. And this is how I would put my socks on because I couldn't fucking bend over to put my socks on. So I don't have to use that device anymore. It's a cool little device. You just put your sock on the end of yeah. it, grab the rope, slide it up your feet. Oh, that's, how, that's how bad it was. Mm -hmm. I don't have to use that anymore. So it feels like a, an epiphany is going on when I can tie my shoe now. So what about the blood markers? Everything's, again, I'm not, somebody would say, well, Joey, you need to know, understand what these numbers mean and what this is and what that is. Well, well you, have, not, you have somebody to do that. So are they better? Yes. Okay. Much, much better. Yeah. Um, we, had, yeah. uh, we had a checkup about six months ago. And everything, she was super, super happy, you know, how everything was going. I didn't have to get on blood pressure medicine. I didn't have to get on any cholesterol medicine. She allowed me to let me see what I could do first. Because I told her, I said, I don't want to take all this fucking medication. I feel like that's a cop out. You know, some people have to. I get mm -hmm. that. I understand that. I wanted to try and do it without that. I did not want to get on all these fucking medications. So I didn't. And she was very impressed. She was like, I can't believe that you got these things down. And I said, well, it wasn't just me. I had a lot of help. Um, and she's like, well, now you might live a little bit longer. So in all these years, you, you never once no. had your blood work done? Not one time. <laughs> I know. I okay. know. <clears throat> well, I mean, that's... <laughs> I don't want to sit there and say, well, no shit, something like this was going to happen, right? Yeah. Because you have no idea that it's creeping up. But in your defense, I'll also say that, you know, I was fortunate when I came to Columbus that I hooked up with a doctor that was willing to do my blood work and mm -hmm. understood what powerlifting was. Didn't like any of it, but yeah. everything was kind of like, okay, until it wasn't, you know, my yeah. blood turned to sludge like yours did. Same <laughs> story. Right. And, but then things changed, but that was hard, you know, to find somebody like that then yep. was i could imagine one in one in a million because most of the time you go in to see a doctor and all they're going to do is tell you everything that you're doing is bad yeah get off the steroids stop doing this stop lifting weights yeah lose 40 no no lose 100 pounds quit lift and eat better yeah and you're like motherfucker i'm paying to come here and all you're doing is telling me this meanwhile i gotta i need fucking an antibiotic or whatever it's yep. gonna be so I think what happens, at least what used to happen, maybe not so much today, is after one or two times of doing that, you're like, fuck that. I'm not going to go back to see a doctor again. Yep. All they're going to do is tell me I shouldn't power lift and shouldn't lift weights. I've heard it a million you know, times. Where, you know, today we have companies like one of the sponsors of the podcast is Merrick Health. Yep. You know, so they run labs, they do labs, yep. and they work with lifters. And if lifters still want to blast shit through the moon, they're, they're not going to encourage that but they'll help the lifters to mitigate that. Yep. And if people have low T and all the other stuff, they can 
you know, prescribe the testosterone or whatever, but pretty much the same thing that you just went through is kind of the whole service that they had, but we didn't have that. Right. No. You know, and thank God it exists today. Well, you've got to understand at some point, you know, in defense of my ignorance, I am where I live and how I came up through this is much different than what these guys are coming up through now with the knowledge, the internet, um, the, the information that's out there on how to take care of, not, not that you need, need it to have common sense, but you were living on the edge for years, just like I was thinking you were invincible Mm -hmm. and everything's going to be okay. And sometimes you need a dose of reality to bring you back to life. And unfortunately, we don't get smarter until we get older. And the smartest day of your life is the day that you, your last day on this planet. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So everything, especially like I explained to my guys at the gym, you're never going to understand things until you make mistakes. I try to help them understand from bad decisions with women to things that they're taking or how they're treating their bodies and not getting rest. But I I did have a couple of people tell me things like this and I'm like, man, fuck that old man. What does he know? Well, we, we are looking at it differently though, too, because it's <clears throat> now it's about optimization too. Yes. So if you go back and look at some of the doses that you may have used, maybe you didn't need that big of a dose, but you needed a variety of different things to get a better response. Yeah. But you know, our, <laughs> our mentality was get bigger. Yeah. And it's everything was go just bigger, like, go home. Yeah, just fucking more and more and more. Yeah. But I'm sure there was a lot of times throughout that whole process that it was working against us instead of for us because the recovery becomes so bad. Yes. Because everything's fucked up. You it, know, where, it goes back to that old adage you said, I wished I'd have known what I knew now 20 years ago. Yeah. See, a lot of the joint pain could have just been all the sugar in your system. Could have been. You know, you don't know, mm-hmm. you know, could, you eliminated a lot of things at one time. So you don't kind of really know what variables, what yep. but the, um, everybody kind of hits it. It's just now I don't think they have to hit it. Like if they can get blood work done once a year, just to see if, even if they're competitive yep. to see where is my test at now, some, some, <laughs> some tests will only measure up to like 1200. Yeah. Where I know a lot of people like that, fuck that, it needs to be way higher than that. So you got to have a test to know mm-hmm. if it needs to be higher than that. Um, <clears throat> where some, I've, I've just personally looking at my own blood work over the past, fuck, since 90 or whatever it's going to be. <clears throat> the, um, so my testosterone's been high. At, well, I can't measure when I was really stupid because I wasn't getting things done there. Right. You know, so <clears throat> my testosterone's been higher sometimes on lower doses. You know, it's just, how what you're taking how you're taking it and all this other kind of stuff where before it was just shotgun everything but i've had blood work done where i was taking more way more than normal and my testosterone was like eight or nine hundred right like, this is fucked up like what the fuck like is my shit fake like what's what's going on somebody is a bogus whatever it's going to be why am i not utilizing this and it was just optimization synergy you know that so that's awesome now for the younger ones coming up because they can find that and then stay optimized longer. Cause it makes you wonder when you look back how many years or how many meets did I do that was fucked up Yeah, that I thought it was optimized, but it was actually weighed down because of synergistic factors. And I never about. thought about it. That was never yeah. anything in my mind at any point that I think about my blood work or mm-hmm. honestly, even, I don't want to say I wasn't thinking about my health, but not at the point that I'm thinking about it now at 49. Yeah. Well, you did have it done, though, because every time you went in for a surgery, they were testing hemoglobin oh, yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. So they would have told you yeah. if it was way out of whack, they would have let you know that. Right. So it was But I there. didn't go out of my way to do it because, yeah. I, honestly, I didn't. I, it's not that I didn't care. It's just it wasn't a priority in my mind to think about. I'm just going to be honest about mm-hmm. it. You know what I'm saying? I just It never was a priority to get my blood checked, get my numbers check to give blood to all i was worried about was getting stronger and lifting yeah but part of getting stronger is being able to recover from the sessions i agree that you're doing. i'm just telling you yeah i know i know how I'm you, just, I, I'm just I telling you how i thought you know i live that way and 2020 is hindsight now but i can't change what i was no I can no only no. do what i'm doing now yeah. moving forward and 
but it's good to talk about because there's people out there that are still thinking that same way that might be 23. Yeah. And it's like, it can be optimized and forget the optimization. You still need to recover. So maybe yes. you're not recovering because your diet is all fucking cookies and pop tarts and shit like that. But the way I thought is if I have, if I'm big, I mean, if you're big, you can eat more, right? Cause you're yeah. big, you got to mm -hmm. maintain a higher weight. So I'm probably getting everything that I need vitamins minerals and all the other shit just because there's seven thousand calories right <laughs> right i'm pretty sure i'm or covering thousand <laughs> yeah it's like i'm covering all my fucking needs yeah. like so there's no way i'm deficient in anything yeah you know <laughs> but i never had the knowledge and insight to think well maybe it's hurting my recovery because the sugar that's in there or whatever is in there that's just fucking wrecking my system my biggest concern when i started losing this weight is the obvious thing that any lifter is going to start thinking of Am I going to get weaker? Well, you will, because leverage is. I haven't. Yeah. I haven't. I think because I did it the right way, and I did it over a long period of time, it wasn't some immediate 90-day, 30-day, I took a pill, some bullshit thing. I think I did it the right way, the consistent way, the healthy way. And as I'm losing this weight, I'm continuing to train as I normally would train, um, the way I train. And I haven't seen a drop off in anything. I mean, I just had a meet a few months ago and had the best meet of my life at age 49. So how'd you, how'd you adjust? How'd you adjust the, I, because the, I, you're in a band shirt now, so there are some differences with that, but how'd you adjust the squat suit? Cause that's where the biggest leverage change is going to happen. Right? It, it, yes. Um, I haven't tested my squat fully you know now what you saw on open power lifting is true i've only done five full power multi yeah, meets yeah. that's it yeah um and i've only done four full power raw meets in my entire life so everything else has been bench only push pull deadlift only blah 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 um and when we get to talking about our training it's mm -hmm. much different than everybody else's mm -hmm. um but when i'm training especially for a bench meet this may sound crazy to some people, but I don't squat. I do I do a lot of accessory work. Um, but to get back to your answer on the squat, I really am not sure where I'm at. Um, I know because everybody sitting behind me knows that there's something going on with me right now. I tore my last meniscus that I have on my knees. And it has debilitated me for probably about six or seven months. And it's one of them things that, you know, it needed surgery, but I was like, fuck that. I'm not having it. I've had it before. To me, it just didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. um, you're not really fixing it, you know. Um, so just here recently, I'm just getting back into squatting. Um, we're going to squat here with you guys tomorrow. So I'm going to put my suit on for the first time and probably... <sighs> probably a year all right so you'll know for I'll sure know. yeah yeah now i did actually get some new briefs that are coming i was right. hoping they were going to be here before i got here but i've actually dropped two sizes in briefs now for me everybody's different you know there's more than one way to skin a cat for everybody but i like tight briefs in a loose suit that's just me and i use a canvas suit um but there's some people that like it the opposite mm -hmm. like both of them tight or both some of them loose but like I'm at a 44 size brief now. So, so if you look at your bench accessory numbers, where are they at compared to when you were bigger? Well, numbers of the shit that you're doing without the shirt on. So even if it's the reverse band raw. So you, you're asking me what can I, what do I think I can bench raw? No, 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 no. Where are your numbers? Let's say if it's a two board reverse band raw now compared to what it was when you were three over 300 pounds. I honestly I don't know because I haven't tested that. Everything that we do is our as our geared group. Yeah. We use boards, slingshots, reverse bands. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um to put things in perspective, I hit a reverse band or no, I hit a straight up slingshot and they'll have to help me two weeks ago with 805, no board. And how far is that off what it was before? I've never done that in my life. So you never done it before. So it that was 805 so yeah. pounds in a slingshot. Yeah. No shirt, no band, straight up. Mm -hmm. I've never done that in my life. So that's over. 
hell yeah, it's over. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, by a whole bunch. All right. So do you think that either it's maintaining strength or it's, it's gaining strength, right? So it's it's, it's one that's it's not losing, which no. you said it's not losing. So dropping the weight, the leverage that should lose, right? So if you drop the weight, but the leverage, but you don't lose, but you get stronger, then it has to come back on the fact that you're eating healthier means you're recovering better yes. and you're adapting better. My quality of life is 10 times better than it was two, three, four, five years ago. How do you define that? Well, from the basic front is going to be how I feel. I yeah. mean, you know, this is not a placebo effect that's happening with me. You know your body better than anybody, just like I do. I know how I have felt for years. I could just feel that something was off. Something was wrong. I wasn't, I didn't feel, I, I understand I'm getting older, but I couldn't put my finger on it. But the obvious thing was, Joey, take your dumb ass and go get some blood work and find out what's happening. Um, <clears throat> well, the well, the reason I'm asking is because it's, it's a washed up meathead. When, when I, when I think of how I feel, there, there's two, there's two ways to, to answer that. Mm -hmm. I, I used to only care about how I felt in the gym, <laughs> like fuck everything outside of the gym. My real life right. happens in the gym. So how I feel in the gym would define everything else. Like nothing else that mattered yep. except for the, how I felt there. So if that started to feel bad, I'm like, Oh, something's wrong. Mm -hmm. But if that felt good, but everything else felt bad, that's whatever normal. That's how I used to think. Yeah. So when you say, you see what I'm saying? When you say, how do you feel? Then it's, so if you want to talk about my everyday life outside of the gym, yeah, yeah. Well, that's easy to quantify because I have a very physical job. Yeah. I have a very laborious job, um, especially for my age. Now, anything in life becomes monotonous because of you're sure. doing it over and over and over and you're dealing with elements of heat and cold and, you know, this, that, and the other with what I do. I don't feel as fatigued as I used to feel doing the same amount of workload that I do week in and week out. Do I get mentally and physically drained from the day in, day in grind? Hell, who yeah, doesn't? Yeah, yeah. But I don't feel as physically beat up. Now, there's a lot of other things that's going on in my life than just eating better. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't give a shit what anybody says, you know, about what I'm getting ready to say, because I could give a fuck about everybody else does. Um, but I have added some things into my everyday life. I'm being more consistent with massaging. I'm being more consistent with ice plunges. We bought uh, a hot tub, a sauna. You know what I'm saying? My entire week is surrounded outside of work when I get home of recovery things to make my body better and more prepared for the gym. Because at the age that I'm at, I know that this window is closing. And I don't want to be one of these old ass lifters that still thinks he's got it, but he's in the master seven squatting 300 fucking pounds. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And not that there's nothing wrong with that, but that's not what I want. Um, I'm currently ranked number one bench presser in the entire world. I don't give a fuck if it's banned or not for my weight class. Okay. I'm 49 years old, but I'm doing all the things that I possibly can to keep my body optimized, efficient, strong, healthy, rested. You know, I know that I'm getting older now because we're going to bed at 930 at night. <laughs> yeah. You feel what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. There are things that we're doing now that I would have never fucking done five years ago. Can I, I pinpoint, is it just this or is it just that? Or is it an accumulation of all these things together that are making me better? That unfortunately it's taken this shit to happen at this age to do it. And you think, man, what if I would have fucking started doing this at 30? You know, if I would have been more consistent with my blood work, my diet, these rehab protocols that I'm adding, the consistency of what I'm doing, you know, where would I be at? Well, I don't know. I don't have the answers for that. I can only deal with the now and what's going on. But I think that all of these things that I've added in are helping me to some degree, each one of them. I can't individualize which one's doing the best because sure. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not going to sit here and quit one of them and see, you know, how am I feeling this month and then take another one away. But I know cumulatively all of these things are helping me. It doesn't matter to me what some people, some people, man, you know, fuck those ice baths. That shit's stupid. Well, why, do the, why does the biggest sport in the world, which is the NFL, 
Why do every fucking facility at every NFL stadium have ice baths for their billion-dollar company for their multi-million-dollar players to soak in every day? Right? Yeah, well, they've had that for 40 years. Yes, they have. Yeah. Ice baths go back 3,500 years. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter what anybody thinks about it. I feel like they work. I feel like it helps me. But so do I, so do I with the sauna. So do I with the hot tub. So do I with the massages. Um, so do I with a lot of the, you know, like the Donnie Thompson stuff we use a lot at the gym, the body tempering. There's a lot of things that I'm doing every single week to prepare myself for Friday at the gym, Sunday at the gym. You know what I'm saying? So Friday and Sunday are your heaviest days. Yes. So then how do the ice baths, how are they implemented? Where do they fall? So um, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Okay. And then that would be when? In the morning, at night? In the or, afternoon, in the when afternoon, I get home when you from home. work. So that's the ice. And where does the sauna and the fall? The sauna falls on Sundays and depending on time frames, maybe on a Wednesday. So after the train. Yes. Okay. And not before the sauna comes before on Sundays. Okay. Um, I just, uh, you know, you can read a lot and do a lot of research and listen to what this person says and that person says, but you got to figure out what works mm -hmm. for you. And it just seems to work better for me before I train. And then the massage when I try to stay with, look, this lady that takes care of M Melissa and I, I would go see her every day. She's, she's the shit. But at least once a month, I know that people say once a month, well, that's better than none a month, mm -hmm. you know, and then there are other times that I'm getting in twice a month. It's just scheduling and time. You know, I thought at this age in my life that shit would slow down. No, I've got more fucking responsibility <laughs> and less time than I've ever had in my entire life, mm -hmm. you know, but I have, you know, this is for this day. This is for that day. This is for this day. This is for that day. And it's not. Be, in, in, in any particular order it just those are the days it works out best for me how long have you been doing that specific say protocol eight months eight months do you feel like your body's adapted to any of it well i don't know if you ever adapt to jumping in 40 degree water <laughs> um no i hate it every time um we, not adapted but adapted in, in how it helps your recovery i don't think so because with the with the ice baths it's only twice a week mm -hmm. i feel like if you were doing that i've read people do it every day you know and do it for 30 minutes at a time i do it 12 minutes twice a week that's it i feel like that's enough for me i've done it long enough to feel like i'm getting enough benefit out of that could i add another day maybe i just don't have enough time to add another day um we do the 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 hot tub we do that at night before we go to bed what that does for me is it helps my muscle and my body relax before i go to bed that way i'm not having to rely on a drug to do that mm -hmm. and that's just for me that just works for me yeah we have noticed our quality of rest getting in the hot tub say at nine and we only sit in there 15 minutes and we try to do that almost every night our quality of sleep is increased by 100 percent because you're so relaxed and um, your muscles and your tendons and your body. And I'm just ready to go to fucking bed as soon as we climb out of that thing. And it's helped me. Now, maybe it's a placebo effect. I don't know, but it works for me. Well, the reason I'm asking is because these recovery modalities are kind of like training. Yes. You know, how you can recover. You, you got to stay consistent with yeah, it. Yeah, it's. Well, with the consistency, but you can also adapt to it. You can't yes. do the same training program all the time. No, your body you're right. Adapt. But how you're implementing in, in there is sporadic. I don't want to say sporadic because it's consistent, but it's not like you're running one thing for three weeks at no. a certain dose and then pulling off of that and then going to do another thing for yep. three weeks for a certain dose yep. and running it that way. So there, the purpose that you're putting them then in there is for different. This is the interesting thing when it comes to training and all this shit is it, it may be because the people that might criticize what you're saying, what they don't understand is things can work for reasons outside of what they think they work for. Exactly. Like people used to trash on the box squat all the time. <laughs> right. Right. right? Yep. And because Louie might say something like, well, you're going to go from a static to a dynamic. So that's, you can't do that or whatever the reason is. Well, maybe it's because it reinforces your technique. Maybe. You know, and well, you know, so yeah, I'm saying, so there, there, I agree with I you. I can stack eight different reasons why yeah. it could be working, but people will pick the one thing and say, oh, that's bullshit because it doesn't do this. Yep. 
And like, well, what about the other six things? Yeah. But they, they don't think about that. Of course it, not. You know, so there's, and then there's the individual differences amongst all those as well. There's some other modalities that we use, um, and I'll throw these in there just as well because I know Melissa's sitting there thinking, we do a little bit more than that. Yeah. Um, I have some infrared um, heating pads that are not just your normal heating pads. I have this one for my arm because this is the arm I have the most problem with. I mean, this this insulated heavy arm pad was $400 Theo. I mean, it's something else, and it heats up to like 154 degrees. I try to use it twice a week on a different limb, knees, arm. You know, one night I'll do it right knee. I mean, I'm sitting there watching TV anyways. Yeah. Um, that's something else that I do that I think has helped. Uh, again, there's other things that we use. The the what's the 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 proper thing for those guns? The Theragun. Theragun. Yeah, yeah. Percussive. We use that. Um, we have tens and, um, what's the other thing besides the tens? Ultrasound. Yes. Ultrasound. We use that. Now, all of these things are, those type of things are when I have time and I'm thinking about it. So it's not like I use those every day either, but there's a lot of other things that are involved. I mean, we have a rehab station at our house. Mm -hmm. I mean, we bought a fucking massage table. You know what I'm saying? just for a lot of these things because it's better than laying on the floor. Yeah. Well, you your know, head, your fucking head, you can't lay on. Yeah. <laughs> and it's much more comfortable to be on. So, and what I want to drive home, if people doesn't, which I don't care if they, what they believe in, but if you're, it's like with training, let's just say, and this is my biggest problem with people with training. They get this template. And they try it for three months, and they're like, this shit didn't fucking work. Mm -hmm. Really? Three months? That's all you gave that? How about do it a year? You know? Mm -hmm. oh, I bought this this shirt. It doesn't work. Bench shirt. How long have you been using it? I've been in it four or five times. Really? That's it? Why don't you use it for a year? Two years. You know, Dave Hoff used the same goddamn shirt for, what, 10 years? Still is. And still is. You know? Um... I used the same shirt to bench in that ace that I had forever until I blew it out at every meet that I did for probably nine years until it blew up. Mm -hmm. And that was just when I was really getting good with it. You know, you know that those metal shirts are mm -hmm. much different than everything else. Not everybody could lift in those, but it took time. And that's the same with these other things. It's you have to have the consistency of doing it. If in the same with a diet, it's the same with anything. If you're not doing these things consistently with, with consistency, you're never going to know if it actually works or not for you. And you may have to tweak some things to make it work for you. What works for you may not work for me. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I feel that that's the problem with a lot of people with some of these things. Then the other problem is laziness. Let's just be honest. Everybody wants a quick fix. They want to feel better now. Well, shit, I do too. You know, mm -hmm. but I don't want to be on drugs and rely on a Percocet or, you know, some painkiller all the time. If these are these other things that I can utilize and they're helping me, whether it's a figment of my imagination or not, I feel better. So that's my take on it. So if, if we're to take your let's go way back when you first started powerlifting and started training. So what did your training look like then? Let, let me bring this back when you. There's a certain point because you're training, just kids were just training, like getting fucking strong and all that. When you decided that you wanted to start competing, what did that look like then? Not now, but what did it look like then? Honestly, Mike Schwenke and I started doing this together when we were kids, okay? And I mean, you know my story, but we didn't know what we were doing at any fucking point in time. We were just lifting. And it seemed like every time we lift lifted, it didn't matter if it was accessories or main lifts. We were just trying to beat each other. Mm -hmm. So in our twenties, when we started going to, um, I just want to call them local meets. They weren't sanctioned meets. 
I mean, we're at YMCA in Charlotte. We're at a National Guard Armory in Asheville, you know, and we're competing in these meets. Those numbers are not on yeah. on that, but I still count those. Mm-hmm. My 530 raw bench is not on there, but I did that at the Y at a competition mm-hmm. in Charlotte. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. I still count that fucking lift. Well, you did it. Yeah, I did it. And I, <laughs> I hate to say this, but I still got the goddamn trophy for winning that, mm-hmm. you know? So Michael and I, and if people don't know who Michael Swanky is, they need to look him up and understand who that dude is. This was my training partner. He is from McDowell County, just like me. We started Nebo Barbell together. Mike, there was Ed Cohen's record at 220. Travis beat that. That's who we'll get to that in a minute. Yeah. Well, as we're training with Travis, guess who takes down that record? Swanky. He beat Travis's record that beat Ed Cohen's record. Mm-hmm. You know, and then um uh, uh, Matt Kay comes in and beats Swanky's record. You know, so it was just this back to back to back to back things that's going on. Swanky and I started this thing together. And we didn't know what we were doing. Like I said, the internet was not prominent. We had really nothing to go by. We had Powerlifting USA to read. And So were you laying things out like in a linear approach, like the workout of the month, or were you just fucking maxing out? Pretty much. Out? We were, well, I mean, to be honest, Dave, we were just maxing out all the time. Honestly, when he left to go to the military, is the best fucking thing that ever happened to either one of us. Because <laughs> we were going to kill each other. Not mm-hmm. because we were hating. We were just training yeah, yeah, so yeah. fucking hard. And it was just... There was no rhyme or reason to what we were doing. Uh, it didn't matter if we were doing bicep curls. We would kill each other till somebody quit. We were doing shrugs. It didn't matter. It, um, we were doing push-ups. You know, it's just we trained balls out constantly because we didn't have anybody to teach us how to do this. You, you got to realize we're in a town of one high school. In the middle of fucking nowhere, in the mountains, no internet at that time. Who are we supposed to learn from? There's nobody to learn from. That's when we're at a meet, and I'm in Winston-Salem, I think, at the time, doing a bench-only raw meet, and that's how I meet Travis. And that right there is what kind of got me going. I knew who he was. But that's what kind of got our foot in the door to the first time of us training under somebody that knew what the hell they were doing. Now, honestly, I can't remember back that far what we were doing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. But we were in a more controlled environment. It wasn't just fucking balls out trying to kill each other in yeah. there. You know, we just, I would assume it was probably a more of a linear approach. So probably a month so. of fives and some threes yes. and some singles. You know, we were training with. Chris Mason mm-hmm. and Travis and Hannah. Um, uh, Big dude. Chris. Uh, oh, come on, man. I know who you're talking about. He's in there. Uh, Barry Williams. Uh, man, that's killing me right now. Clark. Yes, yes. Yep. No, it's, it's yeah. Yeah. And, and there, there were several other people that were in that group. But, you know, this was before... I mean, I think Travis was kind of might have just tapped in with y'all at that time. He wasn't who he was yet. Mm -hmm. And Chris was not, I know he was not with y'all yet. So we were kind of in their infamous uh, infant stages of their career at that point. But he was still more progressed in training methodology than we were. You know, from his standpoint, I mean, I'd never trained like that in my life. I didn't know what the hell I was doing because I was like, we're in a structured environment. What is this? Well, you take a, you had a, a, a strong crew and yeah. then you start to put some structure behind it. Of course, things are going to go up. Yeah. And we had several people. Look, during those days, Dave, I don't feel like there was anybody. And look, I understand West Side and this, that, and the other. I get that. But there was a point, and you know this to be true, that North Carolina was the fucking shit at one point in time. Mm-hmm. We had some heavy hitters all over the place, female and male. Mm-hmm. Um, I think at one time you had five North Carolina lifters on the team at one time, possibly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Chris, Travis, Hannah. other Chris, Hannah, me. Mm-hmm. I was the last North Carolina mm-hmm. lifter to come on, I believe. And, you know, we were all training together. That entire group was training together. We didn't realize what was going on at the time because Travis was, he was the guy. 
Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Everybody else was still f- f- filling themselves out in the sport, but Travis was the guy. And, you know, more maturation started to happen, and, you know, Hannah started getting better. Ox started getting better. I was the last in that group to kind of really start coming on because I'd never been in nothing like this before. I was, and we were driving two and a half hours just to train with these guys. Mm -hmm. So it was quite the crew. And I learned in a a whole lot and I wasn't really introduced to gear. Maybe a year into being down there, I was just training raw because, you know, gear was hard to come by Mm -hmm. you know it wasn't like now that you know like at our gym we've got 100 pieces of gear laying around for any weight class Mm -hmm. so once i think travis was like okay um i've got an old bench shirt you know an old metal pro we're gonna put you in so you know that was my sort of my introduction but i wasn't competing in it yet and what was that like when you put that on for the first time it's sucked. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, these people, the the end of, and I'm not hating on band shirts because I lift in them now, and we'll get to that topic mm. later, but the, the, the individuals that did not get the opportunity to lift or choose not to, to lift in multiply shirts, I'm going to give my own opinion about that. We can go to any powerlifting meet 10 years ago, and you're going to see 900-pound squats. You're going to see 1,000-pound squats. You're going to see 700-pound deadlifts, 800-pound deadlifts. But I always felt like that multiply bench was the fucking equalizer in any meet because at any moment, somebody could bomb Mm -hmm. because of that shirt. Yeah, yeah. I always felt like squatting and deadlifting was easy in gear to to a degree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Much easier than a shirt. I could remember so many big-name lifters that was squatting nine or a thousand, pulling seven or eight and benching five or 600 pounds. Mm-hmm. And you and I could name 20 guys off the top of our head. They didn't, they could not master that shirt. A lot of people could not master that shirt. Any shirt for that matter. Any shirt. Because those fucking poly shirts were an animal. You were having to take your maximal fucking weight to touch. Unless uh, yeah. you... I have a funny story on that because there were a couple meets I remember judging at and a head judge. <clears throat> I never wanted to be the side judge because, you know, the head judge, you can't call depth. So you're kind of removed <laughs> from being that person. That Right. I didn't want to be the person that's going to judge somebody I sponsor or judge somebody I know yeah. and then red light them and have them be. That happened once. I and understand. I'm like, I'm never doing that again. So then on the front, but I remember. No, no, no. So on the squat was front and the bench was the side. And one of those meets, it got to a point, it was probably like the second meet I ever judged. I'm like, you know what? Fuck it. You know, because I, I didn't want to bend over, you know, to get the thing off the ground. And I didn't want to <laughs> set it on my lap the whole time because they were a little switch. It was a different yep. thing. Yep. So I just left the fucker on red. When the bench came, I just left it on red and threw it on the ground. Because I very did. rarely did I have to bend down to pick it up. Right. Right. Now, if it was the, you know, if it, if it was the opposite, where if I just turned it on white, I'd be bending over every fucking that's how to, to validate what you're saying that's how it was yep. it's like first attempts unless they're going raw then pff, who the fuck knows a, a token lift more or less yeah a token lift then who the fuck knows yeah then it's very unlikely that they were going to get it half the time they were bombing out. it was a 50 50 shot it mm-hmm. was yes and, and i always thought whoever makes the bench in these meets is going to win this fucking meet and that was the majority of the time that was the that was the deciding factor, in my opinion, coming up through the poly days. Mm-hmm. That bench shirt was the fucking equalizer. It changed things. You know, it, it was very rare. You take Dave and Donnie out of the picture, you know, with what they've done in poly shirts, and I think Donnie's benched, what, 950 in a full power meet. Dave's done 1,000. After you come back from that, there is a very select few individuals that were benching consistently 800 or more yeah. in a multiply shirt in a it's full power true. meet. It's tricky. Yes. Right? Because <clears throat> how do you train it if you have to be 90% a plus of your strength to be able to actually practice the skill of the shirt? It's not like you can put the shirt on and practice with a doll rod. Well, Swank, <laughs> Swanky and I, we, we this is how our training methodology started. We asked ourselves the same question. Once we started getting the hang of things, 
how do we train in these fucking shirts with maximal weight all the time and learn how to touch? Yeah. How do you do this? Because that's the problem. That last fucking inch, that's where it all happens right there. Mm -hmm. It ain't the descent. I'm not saying the descent doesn't have anything to do with it, and I'm not saying the lockout don't have nothing to do with it, but you've been in this game long enough to know. That's where you fuck it up. This is the whole world mm -hmm. right here. This area right here. So we kept banging our heads together, trying to think of what in the hell can we do to figure out. I don't know what you've looked at on there, but I've done over, I've done right at, if you count from when I was 20 years old till six months or four months ago, my last meet, right at 60 meets. Okay. I have bombed four times in my entire career. That's pretty goddamn good numbers, I think. Mm, yeah. I don't know what that percentage is, but it's pretty good. And I think because of what we have figured out for ourselves to work, that's where our reverse band methodology came into play. We looked at it as we were training wheels on a bicycle. We're riding the bike with some help, but I'm riding the bike. I'm not wrecking. I'm not falling off, but I'm riding the bike. So if we do something with these bands, I don't have to have boards. I can use that maximal weight, and I can start learning how to touch. Now, somebody's going to say, well, how do you learn to touch if you're using this big band or this big band? I have the answer for that, but we're not got to that point yet. But at the time, we were just using, let's put in perspective, say, a green or an orange. Your mm -hmm. colors, green or orange. And we would choke the band, not double the band, choke the band. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So you're not getting a whole lot out of it. I mean, really, at liftoff, you're not getting shit out of it. Mm -hmm. You're talking about a seven-foot rack with a choke. That is not helping you do jack shit at the top. Mm -hmm. It's not even helping you in the midway point. It's helping you a little bit down at the bottom, and then right when you get the touch, it, it, it to me, it's like somebody popping the bar for you, you know? Mm -hmm. That's how we learned how to touch with maximal weight. And the more we did it, the more we got better and the more consistent we were at meets. So you have to realize out of almost 60 meets that I've done in my life, if you take the nine full power meets out of it, the two push pulls, that's 11, and the one deadlift only, every other meet, almost over 40 something meets that I've done bench only, I've bombed four times. Mm -hmm. And I believe it was because of what we mastered and how we do it. Now, you want to go to another level on how we train, you can look at every single lifter of mine and how many bombs they have taken in the last 10 years. I can count five in 10 years of all of my lifters. Something must be working. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, something must be working. So when, so how did that evolve, right? So that's how it started, it, but you're not training your lifters now the same way you were 10 years ago. No. When, when Mike went off to the military, we had a base of what we were going to, what we were doing. And, um, uh, and I know you're going to laugh, but redneck Tim, and they all know who redneck Tim is. He and I got together and we just started devising some things on our training. And what people didn't understand years ago that were training with us, they were test dummies. I was using them for test dummies. I wanted to see what happened with them before I did it. Mm -hmm. As fucked up as that may sound, it is what it is. Yeah. They were the test dummies. And Melissa knows this, and you you may joke about the spreadsheet thing. It's not a joke. I am, I've got shit oh, I know that goes that. back years of every lift, meets, my lifters, everything. So I would tally these things constantly on what we were doing with who we were doing it with, what lift we were doing, and if it worked or not. And I'm not getting to specifics yet. It's just different shit we were trying. Mm-hmm. So I was like, this don't fucking work. This didn't work with anybody. <laughs> yeah. This sort of worked. This really fucking worked. So I told Tim, I said, I need to learn some shit from some other people. So I don't know what people know, but I'm going to explain some things to you. 
I took some great training under some fantastic lifters, and they're, they're probably going to hear this. Some of them have contacted me before, before I came out here. So I trained under Shane Sweat for about two years with Laura and Shane. I did conjugate training for, I'd say, a good solid two years under Shane. I even traveled to Cincinnati a couple of times for them to teach me how to properly box squat. Mm -hmm. Okay, I wanted to know how to do every facet. You know this. I trained under Jeremy Frey for over two years with his block periodization. Two, I know a good two and a half solid years with him. Completely different than what I was doing with Shane. Mm -hmm. I started training with Brandon Lilly doing the cube. I did that for about two solid years. Completely different than all that. I can't remember the guy's name, and I feel sorry for it, but I did Chico for about a year. I hated that shit. That was the worst <laughs> training method. of, And I know somebody's going to get mad about it, and that's okay. That's the worst shit I've ever done in my life. I thought I was going to die during that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Dave Hoff put me together a training regimen on bench um, that I did for probably about eight months. Brian Carroll did the same thing for me. I mean, they all know this. I have all their training, and I was practicing all of these things. And I was taking the best of each of these things that I liked and using them in the methods that I was trying out at the gym. Again, test dummies. Mm -hmm. So there were some things in conjugate I did not like. Mm -hmm. There were some things in block periodization I did not like. There were some things in uh, Bra uh, Brandon Lilly's uh, cube I didn't like. But there were some things that I did. So I started correlating these things together. I like to look at our training of like a hodgepodge of all types of training, which at, at the end of the day, that's what it all is anyways. Yeah. It, it's all that. <clears throat> so I started, the first thing I did was trying out a reverse band method on squat and deadlift. I knew it was working on bench with geared lifters i'm being specific mm -hmm. because it did teach us how to touch the consistency is proven there i don't care what anybody says i didn't do those for ego lifting i was doing doing it for a purpose at the time because i couldn't figure out another way to ride my bike so to speak yeah that was helping me ride my bike and i got very good at touching because of that you know i'm putting a green band on there choke that's not doing a whole lot I'm putting that orange band on there and it's allowing me to handle that big big weight and it would help me. So I started trying it out on the squat. I was like, this is sort of working. Then we would do it a little differently. This is still sort of working. Same thing on the deadlift. It took me about three years, tons of notes, tons of spreadsheets, tons of goods, tons of bads. And what we came up with and where we're at right now is so dynamically different than what it was 10 years ago. It's not even funny. But still to this day, I still feel like we're, it's like what you said earlier. You can't keep doing the same thing and expect different results. Mm -hmm. So again, I keep up with all of these numbers and all of these attempts. And I take all these videos of my lifters and I watch them all. And I'm analyzing technique, how they move, you know, how things are going on. But at the end of the day, then I'm looking at these meat numbers and I'm like, that's a PR, that's a PR, that's a PR. The consistency of what we were doing, even with our veteran lifters, still continue to do this. So they know the complexity of what goes on in the gym, but sometimes to just sit here and explain it is difficult because it's not the same for everybody. Mm -hmm. Because we do grassroots coaching, I need to understand my individuals and my lifters. I need to see you on your good day. I need to see you on your bad day. I need to know when you're fighting with your wife, cheating on your wife, drinking beer, hungover, whatever it is. I need to understand when I can put my thumb on you, when I can push you, when it's time to pull you back. There are so many different dynamics involved with every individual that not everything is always going to work because the dynamics of what that individual brings to the gym each day, bad day at work, they're not feeling good, you know, whatever. But when everything is on keel and I can see the continued progress, I know when to push and I know when to pull back. 
So, <clears throat> with the squats, what I have learned throughout the years, and again, somebody's going to disagree and point out this, but I can give you 10 other reasons of why it works. So what we do is we do a 12-week training cycle. And we do raw and geared the same on squat and deadlift. The only one that I don't do the same is the gear and raw is completely different. I do not use bands with raw lifters on bench. Mm -hmm. It does not work. I have tried every single facet to make it work, and it doesn't work. It just doesn't. I cannot get it to carry over. So I had to figure out something different for them. So what I've done is on the squat, and I'm going to use your bands colors because that's what we've always used. We start with a black band at 12 weeks out on the squat. Now, this is only going to happen with my advanced lifters. If I have somebody new or that's been there six or seven months, I don't feel like they're advanced enough to, to, for this to work. You got to be there a couple of years for this to really dig in. I have to get maxes from you. I have to know where you're at physically. You've got to build a foundation. You know, I just can't throw you into this shit and you bench 400 pounds with a black band and you think that you're really doing that. Yeah. That's not how yeah. this works. They all know they are supposed to keep their own notes of what their best black band is, what their best blue band is, what their best gray band is, their orange band, their green band, their red band, right? So when we start a new training cycle, I ask you, Zach, what is your best black band squat? I can look it up and try to figure it out. He'll give me a number. Well, we know right out the gate, that's the number that we want to beat, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we're looking for that PR. So Zach just hit a 40-pound PR on a squat from last training cycle. That's fucking humongous, you know? Dylan is a veteran lifter that's been there 10 years, and he just had a 30-pound PR squat. You know what I'm saying? Now, we throw in another variable that's involved in this, and it's knee wraps. And I think you know somewhat of what I do with this. We do not use the same knee wraps. And I know this sounds very complicated and, and stupid to some degree, but I can't have the best knee wrap on you with a black band. That is stupid. I don't know really what's going on if I'm giving you a heavy knee wrap mm -hmm. and a big black a band. Mm -hmm. So we put the greens, the green wraps which we seem to think that those, and I'm not being, those uh, are the yeah, least, yeah, yeah, yeah. the least of the wraps. And that's all you're going to get. Then we'll allow you to work up to a black and white knee wrap. I'm sorry. We just call them colors. We yeah, don't yeah, call yeah. We don't use the names, <clears throat> but we never take the big blacks, the knee wraps, your big blacks. Mm -hmm. We never take those at all during the training cycle. We take those at the meet now, we do work with those through previous training cycles to get you acclimated because when we put those on, it changes shit. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You're jumping out of a, a, um, out of a, a, out of a Beetle to a Ferrari because the way we wrap and how advanced that wrap is. It's, I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what any wraps is. Your big blacks are the best that we have. Mm -hmm. So the next week... When we go to squat again, we just use the black at 12, the big black band. So now we're at 11 weeks out. So now what are we going to do? This is where I go back to my block periodization days of percentage-based lifting. What I'm doing is, is I know what their best lifts are. So I have a projection chart on the board in the gym. So let's just say Zach's is 750. He's a raw lifter. We're at maybe 60%. I'm just throwing out numbers because mm -hmm. I don't have this laid out in front of me. But we'll do 60% and 65% on week 11 straight up, no bands. Squatting. Technique stuff. Lightweight. <clears throat> then the following week at 10 weeks we go blue band, reverse band. Right? Now, your squat is going to drop but I have an idea of what that amount should be. You know what I'm saying? I've done this long enough to understand the difference between your black, your blue, your gray, your orange, I know what the drop is. I know where you should be at. So then what's your PR for that? So he tells me, I do the equation in my head and I'm like, okay, now we need to hit this. 
that goes on and on and on and on until we get to seven weeks out. We're dropping a band every other week and we have our deload week. Now, unfortunately, with deload week, some of my lifters think that that's a fucking week off. You know, you get yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. It's not a fucking week off. That's not what that's supposed to be, but that's what kind of happens. But it is what it is. But most of the people still come in to do some light accessory stuff, some rehab things, because we've been going heavy for five weeks now, and I mean fucking heavy. People are always asking, why do y'all go heavy so much every other week? Well, the last time I checked, we're practicing to lift a heavy weight for one time at a meet, mm -hmm. right? So when you, when you get a lifter in there and they don't understand what's going on and then they start seeing it in fruition, they're like, say we're at week four and we're at 80% with no band, back to the block periodization thing. And they pick that weight up. They're like, God damn, this weight is light. Because you have been picking up an exponential amount of weight that's twice the load that you're going to be carrying. And you and I both know in the squat, I feel like the pickup is the most important part of the whole damn squat. Mm -hmm. If you fuck that up, everything's over with. You've got to have that right right out the gate. And the way we set up our bands, when you pick that weight up, that band is not helping you. So whatever the weight is you're picking up, you're picking it up. You feel what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. So um, that's kind of a... a so what, you have that deload week, then when you come back after that deload week, the band progression drop is still mm -hmm. every other week and yes. the percentages go up every other week. Yes. They're all singles from week 12 through? Or they're the triples or... On the no band things, there's a couple of, uh, it's a little bit of doubles, you know what I'm saying? And it's multiple percentages. You may have a 60, 65 this week, and then two weeks it's a 70, 75, and then it may be singles, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that's how our progression works. Now, on the- How's it deload into the meat then? When's the last heavy? The, well, what I consider the last heavy, and I consider this differently on each lift, all right? I consider the last heavy your gray band lift, all right, especially on the squat, because I think the biggest jump in the band progression is from gray to orange. I think that's a huge changeover. It's pretty easy to figure out the black, the blue, the gray, mm -hmm. but then when you jump to that orange, you're getting really into the real shit now. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. And then when you're into the green, you're really into the real shit. You know, reality starts setting in at where you're truly at. <clears throat> and we're a little bit different. Um, at three weeks out, we take openers and we take them at two weeks out. I want the openers to be in, in. I want to know without a doubt that you are ready for this to lift these weights in the meat. We practice them over and over. So when we're in our percentage weights, You've really almost lifted these openers already once we're getting deep into the training cycle already. You're just not thinking about it. And then once we're getting to the meet, you're like, didn't we just do this a few weeks ago? I said, yes, we have. Mm -hmm. You've already lifted this weight. You're practicing and getting ready. So it seems complicated, but when you're doing it and you're doing it all the time, it's not as complicated as it seems. Um, now, with the bench, the raw thing is much different. I don't do the reverse bands on raw benches. Again, I, there's, there is... So what goes between? Because it's an every other week thing that I'm seeing here. Okay. So with the raw benchers, we start out week two or week 12 with a, with a two-board max. All right. Okay? The next week, it's a percentage base, same as the geared lifters. And then the following week, it's a one board max. Then the next week, it's a percentage lift. And then the next week, it's a half board max. And then the next week's a percentage, and then we're in the deload. Then we start doing a lot of percentage-based stuff. And this may, at, at this point right here, I can tell with the lifter if things are progressing or do I need to change this projection now is, or cause we're not at the point of no return yet. Mm -hmm. I can change this projection just a little bit to bring the weight down a little bit. That's when we're really working on going from touch and go to a slight pause to a real pause. 
Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So at that point for the raw, I know I can tell if things are working or not. Again, everybody's different. So I may have to change it. So the boards are dropping out at that six weeks. Yes. And then it goes to basically a, like a touch and go mm -hmm. to a soft touch mm -hmm. to a pause to yes. a, a real pause. Yep. Okay. And then the deadlift. Now with the deadlift, <clears throat> I can't explain this one. And I have numerous spreadsheets on this and I can't explain it. But whatever I do, it works great for the women. I just think women love to deadlift more than guys. Now, we do have three 700-pound deadlifters that have been in my gym, and we have a potential other one right now that's sitting over here. He just have not done it when it matters. Mm -hmm. um, so we do the same band progression as we do on the squat, except these are choked lifts, not it's the setup is different. And we use two inch blocks. Sometimes I incorporate four inch blocks at the very beginning, just to lift a very heavy weight. Uh, we don't do rack pulls and there's multiple reasons why we don't do rack pulls. I don't think that it, I've never seen it actually really carry over well. It fucks up your bars for another one. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that it's a real position of starting because yeah. the, the bar's bent. So I like to use boxes instead because I think that's a more reality, real starting position using the blocks. So with the black bands, how much weight does it take to actually ground on the floor? Three plates. Okay. So three plates is essentially, what, like, what 135 at the bottom? Yes. All right, and then the that's blows two plates. All right, so then that's singles. Yes. Now does the block drop? The block stays all the way up till deload week, mm -hmm. and then we start pulling from the floor. But we, <clears throat> this is where I figured out things started working better when I just didn't go black, blue, gray, orange, green. Once we got through the black blue gray area in the two inch blocks i would only use a green going into the floor on our way out of the training cycle that way there's more of a reality of pull going on mm -hmm. that green ain't doing a whole lot for you especially the way it's set up the way we have it set up it's a it's a delusional effect pretty much yeah you know what i'm yeah, saying yeah. um now some people say well, when you're putting the bands, it's keeping the bar in line that you're getting used to. But when the bands aren't there, you're not accommodating the the movement of your body because that band's holding you in place. Not I, with a mini band. Sorry. Not with a mini band. And that's <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you, now yeah, you just yeah, said yeah, what yeah. I wanted to say. Yeah. I said not with a fucking mini yeah, band. Yeah, with the black one. Yeah. Probably. With a black yeah, one yeah. without a doubt. Yeah. But that's not what we're using the black one yeah. for. Again. We are trying to lift the most weight that you possibly can train for, right? I am not a believer in shit tons of reps. I, I'm just not. I've never seen it transfer for us. I think it's a lot of, I don't like, I, I took dynamic benching out a long time ago. Mm -hmm. I just thought it was just a lot of fucking wear, useless wear and tear. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Um, that, that was my opinion, okay? But like I said, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Everybody's training methodology works if you utilize it and stay with it and use consistency and have some common sense in what you're doing. And obviously what we're doing works. My yeah. lifters keep getting PRs every single meet. So back to the deadlift, does the does the mini band ever come off or is it always on? It stays on till week four, mm -hmm. four weeks out. Then what? Is a percentage of that 85? I mean, do you ever... We're taking what I presume is going to be your opener. Now, I treat the deadlift opener way different than I do the squat and bench opener. And the reason I do this, and everybody's different. Everybody's yeah, different. Yeah. I understand as a full power lifter, at that time, there's nine hours have passed. You're fucking tired. You know, mm -hmm. most people hate deadlifting. I am extremely conservative on a deadlift opener. On squat and bench, I'm not. Mm -hmm. I'm not. We're going after some shit. So let's just like most of my girl, all of my girls except one are 
360 and above deadlifters, okay? We have about four of our girls that are fucking neck and neck in that 360 to 400 range. But I open them all up at the same. We open at 315. Mm -hmm. We're in the meet. Yeah, yeah. It takes the... God damn, I don't know if I really feel like opening with 350 or 370. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, well, a lot can happen throughout the A lot the can fucking days. happen. Yeah. So it, they know going into the deadlift already that it's going to be a conservative lift. And they're so used to making big jumps because of the way we train with the bands. When we get to the meet, it feels no different on the deadlift because they're taking big, ju big jumps to them. Mm -hmm. Same with the boys. I mean, Dylan's a 680 deadlifter, but he's absolutely used to going plate, 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 plate because of the way we train. So if he opens up with 600 and we jump to 650, that's not a big deal for him, you know, on a second yeah, attempt. Yeah. You know, or if we jump to 670, it's not a big deal for him. Um, on the squats, we always do something that I feel you should be able to do a double with no matter what. Your worst on your worst day. Our second attempts are always going to be for a PR every single time, no matter what happens, unless you just shit the fucking basket on that, you know, and yeah. we're like, <clears throat> but you should already know because you, you've had with the squats, you've had the opener the last two weeks. Exactly. Before. Yeah. We know. Yeah. Now when we take openers and I know I'm bouncing around a lot, but we take openers three weeks out, but we also take second attempts. Now, with second attempts, there's variations that we use. We use the mic, and I know it doesn't, I know you're going to laugh, but on the squat, we use the micro mini. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, what the fuck is that really doing? But maybe five pounds, 10 it's, pounds. It's, it's yeah, a beta yeah, effect yeah, in your yeah, mind. Yeah. So, I mean, just for, to give people some kind of significance here, if it's a reverse mini band, Right. And because I got one on a spider bar because that's where I'm at right yeah. now with what I do. Yeah. It's it's 40 pounds out of the bottom. Yeah. A micro band is half. Yep. Or maybe even less than half of a mini band. And so it 15 pounds probably at the most. Maybe. 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 Yeah, yeah. If that. But I watch my lifters so much and I watch their videos. I understand their speed, their movement. Mm -hmm. Okay. If that little micro mini band's on there and this second attempt that we're going for is a PR and I see the speed that I want to see, I know right then and there we're good to go. That band's not making that much of a goddamn difference. Mm -hmm, you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Third attempts, those are projectionary things that's like icing on the cake. We're not like, I'll put things in perspective. Melissa opened up at her last meet last month with 512 that's the highest she's ever opened but because her squat is increasing so much the opener has to increase <clears throat> so her best squat up to that point was uh 540 but her opener's 512 so the the kilo is i don't know 547 mm -hmm. maybe is the next one so that's the jump we made of course she smoked it and then i'm like let's go 560 on this third one she fucking killed the weight but she had taken 560 on three attempts already with smaller band work you see what i'm saying mm -hmm. <clears throat> but she her foot she stepped back at top at the top when she came up she went to step back got reds mm -hmm. now that wasn't my fault mm -hmm. that wasn't a bad call it was just shit just fucking happened mm -hmm. so in reality, most of their third attempts, especially on the squat, you have already done it. You've just done it with a band in preparation for it with a low band, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. So on those weeks that you're doing those openers, you're also doing seconds and thirds, but you're putting a little more band on. Yes. All right. Does that same scenario happen with the deadlift? No. All right. And then is the deadlift trained with the bench on the same day? No. So there's separate days. How's it? This, this is layout? our training split. Yeah, this yeah. is how this works. <clears throat> the girls, when we are like right now, things are different because the girls just did their meet and now the boys are training for their meet. So shit's a little different, but normally for all training at the same time, girls will squat on Monday. Boys will pull on Monday on Friday. It's reverse. 
the boys squat, the girls pull. The reason we do it like that is so the girls can handle us, wrap yeah. knees, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. And on Mondays, that's what we're doing. We're handling them, wrapping knees, doing gear. Mm -hmm. You know, we're deadlifting. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Sundays, we all bench at the same time. And normally we have three benches going. So when we're doing the reverse bands, our geared guys are down there in the rack because that's the only thing we have set up that can do reverse bands. And then on your competition benches, we've got the girls doing raw and shirted work, and then the boys just doing raw, the raw guys. So we have three benches going at one time. And we have a system that we have running. You know, we go from the weakest to the strongest. So whoever the weakest is on the girls, they go first. Whoever the strongest is when, they, when they're done, then we move to the boys, strong, or weakest to the strongest. That way we are giving spotting to each lifter for safety. Yeah. We use five spotters. We use a handoff guy. We've got two people on each side because I don't want to see anybody get hurt. I don't think that you can ever have enough safety. Now, we're not holding the fucking bar. We're not, you yeah, know, yeah. handing it, it to death and stuff like that. But we're all on it just in case. Mm -hmm. I want to see my lifters go home to their children, to their kids, to their job. You know, this is... I hate to call it a hobby because it's not. It's a lifestyle for me. But for some of these people, the reality is it is a hobby. Mm -hmm. And I don't want anybody getting hurt. So our job as a team is to make sure that everybody is safe and everybody has suitable spotters. So this group goes, that group goes, and then this group goes. And everybody moves like a horde to yeah. each station. You know, everybody has a role. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. For safety. Let's take a break real quick because I gotta take a piss as I normally do because I drink tons of water. That water is for you, by the way. Oh, okay. And then we'll come back. Um, guys, uh, leave a comment, like, subscribe, review, do what you're supposed to do. As I want to call out the limited edition apparel, the link is in the description. As I've spoken about before, the limited edition apparel is apparel that I basically come up with. So some of the designs suck, some of them not so much. It's a weird thing. The ones that I think are going to do really well usually don't. The ones that I think aren't going to do really well do really well. Either way, they're all limited runs, so it changes, you know, every single month. But all limited edition items are tri-blend material with, you know, the cut that everybody wants now that's a little bit tighter on their arms so they can show off how big their fucking arms are. The limited edition items directly support the podcast. So head over, pick up your shirt today. Could be a hoodie, could be shorts. We got these ball hugger shorts right now, which I would never wear, but I was told they were super popular, but you know what? They were wrong because they're still sitting there and I probably should discount them right now. Anyhow, if you want to see the discount on the ball hugger shorts, head over, over, over to the limited edition apparel, link in the description box. The Swiss Symposium 2023. Yes, we are bringing this back to Columbus again. The date is October 20 and 21. Columbus, Ohio, Hilton, it's the same location it was last year. If you head over to the website, there's a big banner that links directly to Swiss. There's also a link in the description box so you can see who the presenters are as we are booking them for the symposium. The symposium has been going on for 20 years. It's, in my opinion, probably a little biased, but in my opinion, one of the best symposiums when it comes to strength and conditioning, uh, sport medicine, therapy, physical therapy. Right now, the admission is 38% off or 48% off. It's I'm don't know. I'm not looking. I'm just kind of looking at the camera right now, but it's the early, early, early bird rate. That rate is until July 1st. So now is the best time for you to sign up. When you go to register, there's three different ways that you can res register for the symposium. There's the general admission, which gets you into all the different lectures that you want to go to. The caveat is there's three or four lectures going on at the same time. So the second option allows you to purchase the videos of all the lectures for you to be able to watch at a later time. So that allows you and gives you access to everybody that's presenting if there's two people presenting at the same time that you would really like to see. The format that those are in is 
it's a streaming service. So it's it's if you've ever purchased a training course from anybody before, it's very similar to that. So you log in and then there's all the presentations that are there. You just click, you watch, you stream. It's how it works. The third option is the VIP option. And included in that is the Sunday after the symposium, a limited number of people will be coming out to our gym, the S5 compound at Elite FTS with a handful, maybe a little bit more of the presenters that are there just to train, to hang out, have some barbecue, have a good time. And that again is limited on the attendance. It's already 50% sold out or 50% of the spots left, depending on how you want to look at it. Go to the link in the description. We'll have more information about the Swiss throughout the podcast. As we move forward, we have a lot of the presenters booked for the podcast. So we'll be talking more about it. We'll see you there. As I want to call out the limited edition apparel, the link is in the description. As I spoken about before, the limited edition apparel is apparel that I basically come up with. So some of the designs suck, some of them not so much. It's a weird thing. The ones that I think are going to do really well usually don't. The ones that I think aren't going to do really well do really well. Either way, they're all limited runs, so it changes, you know, every single month. But all limited edition items are tri-blend material with, you know, the cut that everybody wants now that's a little bit tighter on their arms so they can show off how big their fucking arms are. The limited edition items directly support the podcast. So head over, pick up your shirt today. Could be a hoodie, could be shorts. We got these ball hugger shorts right now, which I would never wear, but I was told they were super popular, but you know what? They were wrong because they're still sitting there and I probably should discount them right now. Anyhow, if you want to see the discount on the ball hugger shorts, head over, over, over to the limited edition apparel link in the description box. The Swiss Symposium 2023. Yes, we are bringing this back to Columbus again. The date is October 20 and 21. Columbus, Ohio, Hilton, it's the same location it was last year. If you head over to the website, there's a big banner that links directly to Swiss. There's also a link in the description box so you can see who the presenters are as we are booking them for the symposium. The symposium has been going on for 20 years. It's, in my opinion, probably a little biased, but in my opinion, one of the best symposiums when it comes to strength and conditioning, uh, sport medicine, therapy, physical therapy. Right now, the admission is 38% off or 48% off. It's I'm don't know. I'm not looking. I'm just kind of looking at the camera right now, but it's the early, early, early bird rate. That rate is until July 1st. So now is the best time for you to sign up. When you go to register, there's three different ways that you can res register for the symposium. There's the general admission, which gets you into all the different lectures that you want to go to. The caveat is there's three or four lectures going on at the same time. So the second option allows you to purchase the videos of all the lectures for you to be able to watch at a later time. So that allows you and gives you access to everybody that's presenting if there's two people presenting at the same time that you would really like to see. The format that those are in is it's a streaming service. So it's, it's, if you've ever purchased a training course from anybody before, it's very similar to that. So you log in and then there's all the presentations that are there. You just click, you watch, you stream. It's how it works. The third option is the VIP option. And included in that is the Sunday after the symposium, a limited number of people will be coming out to our gym, the S5 compound at Elite FTS with a handful, maybe a little bit more of the presenters that are there just to train, to hang out, have some barbecue, have a good time. And that again is limited on the attendance. It's already 50% sold out or 50% of the spots left, depending on how you want to look at it. Go to the link in the description. We'll have more information about the Swiss throughout the podcast. As we move forward, we have a lot of the presenters booked for the podcast. So we'll be talking more about it. We'll see you there.
Today's episode is brought to you by EliteFTS.com. Founded in 1998 with the primary aim to live, learn, and pass on. Please help Elite FTS support this mission by smashing the like button, leaving a comment, sharing with a friend, and thinking of us for your training needs. If you can put it in a gym bag or load weights on it, Elite FTS has it. What's going on? I'm Dave Tate, and we are broadcasting from the middle of the Elite FTS weight room, where the underground still thrives and you're part of the crew. It's time to sit down, keep it real, and cut the bullshit. Welcome to Table Talk. As I want to call out the limited edition apparel, the link is in the description. As I've spoken about before, the limited edition apparel is apparel that I basically come up with. So some of the designs suck, some of them not so much. It's a weird thing. The ones that I think are going to do really well usually don't. The ones that I think aren't going to do really well do really well. Either way, they're all limited runs, so it changes you know, every single month. But all limited edition items are tri-blend material with you know, the cut that everybody wants now that's a little bit tighter on their arms so they can show off how big their fucking arms are. The limited edition items directly support the podcast. So head over, pick up your shirt today. Could be a hoodie, could be shorts. We got these ball hugger shorts right now, which I would never wear, but I was told they were super popular, but you know what? They were wrong because they're still sitting there and I probably should discount them right now. Anyhow, if you want to see the discount on the ball hugger shorts, head over, over, over to the limited edition apparel link in the description box. All right, we're back. So we covered the main lifts, you covered the template on how it lays out. I wanted to put a little bit of gap between the main lifts and the accessory lifts too. Kind of like I told you during the break, because it messes with people's head when they start combining things. So with the accessories, how do you put in the accessory lifts with the main lifts? <clears throat> so the accessory volume changes as the weeks change because you're I've just noticed if I put too much accessory work at the end of a workout of heavy squats with a black band or a blue band the work is not getting done the way I would like for it to do, to get done because they're gassed because they're lifting these extreme amount of weights and their central nervous system is taxed, you know, especially if you're a gear whore and, you know, mm -hmm. and all this gear and, you know, all this stuff. So I give them a base to go by. I have a sheet up every single week that I put up in the gym and I give them a minimum on squat day, four accessories to do that I want them to do. These are the things that I think are important. So if I don't ask, or excuse me, if I don't tell them I need glute ham raise work done, mm -hmm. they won't do it. Yeah. They'll just sit on the fucking leg curl. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I need, let's just say, hypothetically on week 12, give me um, four sets of 10 of glute ham raise. Give me four sets of 10 on leg press. Give me four sets of 10 on a super squat. And uh, give me, you know, a hundred on the leg leg curl, something like that. Mm -hmm. I know that seems like a lot, but it, it's really not. Um, I think accessories are absolutely the most important thing to do to make your main lift strong. You're just not going to get strong just fucking squatting. Well, let's drill down into that. So when you say four sets of ten on a leg press, that can either be pure hell or it can be moderate. All right. So that's on the sheet as well. Mm -hmm. All right. When they go to read it, it'll say light, medium, heavy. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that varies from week to week. Now, again, this is a base that I asked for. Yeah. If you want to do more volume or you want to add in more exercises, I'm fine. But this is the minimum mm -hmm. that I want done because I know these are the things you're probably not going to do. Sure, yeah. I know that works. So, so let's just do this. Mm -hmm. And it's the same on bench day. Now, bench day we have a fourth training day on Wednesday. Wednesday is an accessory um, supplemental work day. All right. 70% of the team does not show up for that day. Mm -hmm. it, it It is what it is. Yeah. 
you know, I can't force these people to be there. But we have a core group of about four to five of us that are there on Wednesdays. Let me get back to Sunday accessories. That is the day we do more accessory work than any other day because most of these people are not here on Wednesdays. They're not getting the back work. Mm -hmm. They're not getting the shoulder work. They're not getting all the tricep work that I would like for them to get. So we're there later on Sundays than any other day because I want everybody to, I don't give a shit if you were here on Wednesday or not. I still want you to do this base minimum amount of accessory work because it's kind of, I can't punish one. I punish all, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? So if you're not going to be here Wednesday, you're going to do a shit ton of work on Sundays. Even if you were here on Wednesdays, you're just getting double work. Mm -hmm. But what we, what us as a group on Wednesdays do is going to differ than Sundays because I already know what my minimum work is already going to be on Sundays. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So like on one Wednesday, it's straight back. That's it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we have a magical number. That's 1,000 reps. So on Wednesdays, that's a 1,000 rep day. That's cumulative of all the movements that we're doing. Mm -hmm. And if we're not talking and bullshitting and fucking around in there, we can be done in an hour and 20 minutes. I know that, that may not seem possible, but if you're not fucking around, you can get it done. Yeah. And, uh, and then the next Wednesday, it may just be, you know, some shoulder work. And then the next Wednesday, it may just be tricep. And then the next Wednesday, it may be back and shoulder. Does that make sense? We're getting a variation. But on Sundays is we're probably doing six to seven accessory movements, and that varies in back, shoulder, and tricep. So going back to the heavy, medium, and light, how does that structure with the? It, it tapers off as the training progresses on, in in how how heavy things are going. Yes, I do all the heaviest accessory work in the beginning, and it's just like the bands we taper down as the weeks go on. You're not going to get any stronger three weeks out from a fucking meet. You're either going to be there or you're not. Yeah. I don't want you killing yourself on accessory movements three weeks out. So are, are the accessories after those main lifts, are they all basically hypertrophy work? So they are in the 8, 10, 12 rep range. Yes, but, uh, you know, I don't box them in an area that that's how they have to do it. If I'm asking for 200 reps of this or 100 reps of that, some of them may do five sets of 20 just to get it done because they're yeah. there for time constraints. You know, I got yeah. a lot of parents and time but, constraints yeah. to deal with. But either way, you're, you're in, the, in that little block of that training session, that's for strength, endurance, hypertrophy. Yes. It's not so much strength. So after your main lift, you don't have typically, if you're looking at a strength program, you have a main lift. And then a secondary movement will be something for threes or fives or something like that. Right. Then you break into. Like if we were doing, times. like if we were doing uh, deadlifts, you do RDLs right after or something like that. Yeah, or if you're if you're benching, then after the benching, you're doing close grip two board press for right. threes or whatever. So that's out because of the load of the other stuff, right? Not really. And there are, there are weeks in the in the training to where the raw the raw guys we are doing some close grip work, but it's immediately after the main workload that we're doing yeah. the sets. Yeah, we do have some close grip two board um uh we also do every once in a while i like to throw in something a little differently where we're especially with the boys because it's a dick measuring contest constantly yeah we'll do some rep outs mm -hmm. you know with some things at the very end um and you know it makes good competition in the gym they like to push each other it's a, it's in a volume amount that they're not i really don't like doing during a training cycle that's off season stuff but i do it in there to to break the monotony sometimes, you know, like let's have a rep out competition with 185 today, close grip, mm -hmm. just for the hell of it. Something different. They enjoy it. They like it, you know, it, but that's not what we do on a regular basis. That's just a, a bonus that I'll throw in there unpredictably. Okay. So, but it's not, if I'm looking at a program, I'm looking at how the program is blocked out through the day. Right, the, the main stuff, mm -hmm. then like the three to fives, and then the hypertrophy work, and then like restoration shit that you put towards the end. Yep. Right. So with what I'm hearing from you, that that second block essentially isn't there except for the raw guys because the acts that the overload that's happening 
to the system because of the heavy band work, yep. right? Because that's in there. So then that's done. Because the other option that happens too is if you go really, really heavy, you know, it fucks you up. It right? fucks you up. So then nothing else gets done because yep. you're like, fuck it, I can't do anything. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, ex- ex- so there's not a whole lot you're going to get out of that secondary strength thing anyhow. Right. Because you're already, what, what's it going to do that you haven't already done? I feel like most of the things we do, and I hate to, to, to label it this, I feel like it's a lot of bodybuilding. Yes, well, essentially it is. You know, you it's, know, I would call it the hypertrophy work, yeah. strength, endurance, conditioning, yeah. whatever you want to call it. And then after those main things, because if I'm helping somebody with the program, it kind of lays out a little bit like that, except I have that secondary thing, but I don't have as much overload as what you have. Right. And then after those things that they don't like to do, essentially, but that you're putting that they need to do, the glute mm-hmm. hand raises, it's the shit they don't want to do. I'll put like free time, you know, they can do whatever the fuck they want. Right. But it's 20 minutes, it's got to be done. Because I, I'll have some people, you know, younger kids, they'll be in here for four fucking hours. I have a couple of those sitting in here that would be there five hours if I'd let them. Well, that's a problem. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's a problem. But if you cap it, then do all the fucking curls you yeah. want, but you got 15 minutes. Yep. You know, they can do a lot of destruction in 15 minutes, but yes, normally, they can. normally they don't. Right. They're fucking around, talking. On the, phone, know, on the phone, taking selfies, doing shit like that. Snapchapping so, when. Yeah, yeah. Before they know it, they got three sets and they're like, fuck, my time's up. Yep. Oh, well, yeah, there you go. After a meet, what do you do? So a meet happens, and then what's that block look like? I have always, always done what I'm getting ready to explain. For the people that have competed, the group that has competed, whether it's boys, whether it's girls, whether it's a mixture of both, whoever competed at the meet, they will take seven days off after the meet. Mm-hmm. I don't want them at the gym. I just want them, you know chill out, relax, you know, take some time off. Um, the ones that did not compete, depending on what we're doing, we continue to train. All right. And that's how I've always done it. I just, I just think that it's, I don't want people to get burned out. You know, I I have an older gym, you know, uh, 80% of the people at my gym are over the age of 40. You know, they can't take the beating Mm -hmm. like we used to. So, even myself, I enjoy that week off completely out of the gym, you know, and then when we come back, especially for the geared lifters, depending on what we're preparing for next, if we're going into it, like the boys, us, we just came out of an off season training. We have not been in gear. We have not done a main movement in probably 16 weeks. We have just been accessory stuff, repping stuff. Um, we have a belt squat now that we have not had that we acquired in a in a great deal and we have absolutely loved having that because we're still able to somewhat squat but not the load on our back not the shit on our shoulders not the the damage that the squats doing to your spine and you know we have we're doing 100 and 200 rep sessions with that thing in the off season all right so, so if that's off season say that's a restoration block is yep, what i would call that yep you don't have the reverse bands. You don't have that Mm-mm. stuff in there. No. So it's all bodybuilding stuff. All bodybuilding stuff. And then how long will that last? Well, that depends on what we have on the calendar. We have a calendar in the meet that has meets that we are going to do or possibly going to do a year out. Mm-hmm. And I speak to all the lifters and say, who wants to do this? Who's wanting to do that? Who's, you know, da-da-da-da. So we have an understanding what's happening and who's doing what and who's not Mm -hmm. we can't have everybody do every fucking meet then we don't have people to handle us yeah you know what i'm saying so i can't let everybody do every single meet if it was up to the girls they do i mean they they do every fucking meet that we do and i've and i told them after this one y'all need some time off um i don't think any of the girls have taken a real legitimate off-season training in years because they want to compete they don't ever want time off which is great, you know. Well, how do you avoid this from being a clusterfuck, right? Because you, for this to work optimally, you'd want everybody to do the same meet. I'm the best motherfucking organizer you'll ever meet yeah. in your life. But when you have, you know, 15 people doing 10 different meets at all 10 different times, this becomes a bit of a clusterfuck. Not for me. I've been doing this for so long. I know how to make this work. Well, how's that work if they're... You got somebody that's supposed to use a reverse black band, somebody that's supposed to use a reverse light band, and then four people that are supposed to be using the mini band, and you only have so many stations. Well, we have two monoliths. 
We have three squats. We have three squat stations practically, and we mm-hmm. have three bench stations. We have two deadlift stations. You got to understand, I don't have forty people in my gym. You know, we've got sixteen active lifters, so mm-hmm. it's very easy to manage right. sixteen people. So most of them are going to end up doing the same meets. Sometimes, yes. some things. Sometimes things cross over, and sometimes they don't. I mean, it, it depends on where we're at and what we're doing. Like the girls a few months back did a meet and then they did another meet six weeks later. So I had to devise a plan Mm -hmm. to where what they just came out of into what they're going into. And it can't be the same plan as the first six weeks of a training cycle. And it can't be the same last six weeks of the training cycle. Now, when did you know this? Did you know it before the first meet? Oh yeah. These things are planned out ahead of time. We talk about these things as a group um, months in advance. That's why these things are on the board, why I take notes, and, I'm, yeah. and I know um, who's doing what so we can plan on it. Yeah. Um, if I feel like we don't have enough people to handle a group, then a couple of people's got to back down out of that meet because we're just not going to have – we're just not going to have the people we need. Yeah. Um, My requirements for my gym are simple and easy. It doesn't matter if we have one person competing or six people competing. Every fucking buddy goes to that meet. Mm -hmm. Everybody. That is a requirement because you're wanting the same attention that that lifter is wanting when you're competing. You you get what I'm saying? Everybody in our gym has this person that they're comfortable with who hands off for them, who wraps their knees who puts them under the bar. I don't care about any of those things. Whoever you feel comfortable with, but that person needs to be there for that person to feel comfortable. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when they're not, it kind of throws a kink into shit. It kind of throws our, our, our situation off a little bit. And it happens every once in a while. So you have to be ready. There has to be a secondary person for that just in case. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So we practice with other people just in case these things happen. Like Travis is our handoff guy on the bench for 99% of everybody in there. He's the best handoff guy ever. This is what he does. But when he's not going to be able to be at a meet because his son is so involved in sports, there may be all these events going on. He can't come to a meet. We're like, okay. Somebody else has got to jump in this role. And so we start preparing for that months in advance because he communicates to me which meets he can and cannot go to. You know what I'm saying? So we have, everybody has a role in our gym. And so we're always preparing different people for different jobs and different responsibilities in the gym at all times. All right. Where I was going with is when you have back-to-back meets, but you don't know it. So they do a meet, then like, hey, I want to do this one five weeks. That That's not how it works. All right. No, it shouldn't be how it works. That's not so, how it works. Yeah. So if you know ahead of time, you this can is, plan it. Yeah, this is not a democracy. Yeah. No, I, I call it. the shots in this gym. <clears throat> Who's I, I decide on the meets that we're doing. I decide on the numbers that you will take. I call the openers. I call the second attempts. I put the projections on the board. You know what I'm saying? Your job as a lifter is to lift it takes all the other things out of the way so you can just concentrate on just doing that and as time goes on your trust in me as your coach and what we're doing continues to grow because your success continues to happen oh yeah the reason i put it out is because one of the questions that comes up often is how do you prepare for back-to-back meets and my reply to that is well how far in advance do you know yes because you may not actually really peak for the first one Exactly. You know, then it goes to the second one. Yeah, but, there has to be preparations made for stuff like that yeah, in advance. Exactly. Where with if that is the case, say with them when they had one six weeks later, how much of the adjustment is being made on those last four weeks, knowing that there's still another meet to go to? Is it just the weight? You're talking about the last four weeks in the in next the be- training? No, for the first meet. No, that doesn't change. So the first meet is the one that peaks for, so it's the second yeah, one. It's the second one that changes you know, uh, if there's such a thing, I'm trying to repeat them. Yeah. You know, yeah, you know yeah, what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah. I don't know what to call that except that. So I'm just making up a damn word. But it's kind of, for me, it's it's really, it's difficult for me to explain what exactly that 
How, so Joey, how do you know how to do that? It's it's out of feel thing for me, you know, because everybody's needs. And I can answer it for you if you want me to. Answer away. And so tell me if I'm on or off, right? Okay. So you watch them at the meet. How much did they have left? Did they strain during that? Yes. Yeah. I mean, Are they these... hurt? Have they got yeah. a lingering yeah. injury? Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. The, the, yeah you, you just gave it better than I could yeah. have, but that's exactly right. There's a lot of variables involved on how... And it also, those things are like, I don't think you should do this meet. Mm -hmm. Or did they bomb? Or did they have a good meet? Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of factors that are involved going into this if I'm okay with it, you know. And if I'm not, then you're not, mm -hmm. you know. Or if you're hurt, there's, and you know this, there's a difference between hurt and injured. But it still matters because, because it, it changes in your things. brain, it's going to be these last four weeks are the most important. Yes. There's six weeks. So... If I got to go easy on three weeks instead yeah. of just two, then or if I got to go easy on four weeks and just have two hard, then no, you can't do this meet. I'm all in on the first meet. I guess that's the best way yeah, I yeah. can explain it. Yeah. Because the second meet doesn't have to happen. You know what I'm saying? I want everything. I want every fucking shot taken. I want every everything we've got. I want the pedal to the metal. Well, that's a good philosophy, though, too, if you really think it through. Because what if they get hurt on the first one and the second one doesn't happen? Yes. Right. So then yep. then fuck, you just yeah. wasted, you know, that time for that. Yep. How do you deal with the attrition of the lifters coming through? Because you got a solid crew that's been there for a while, but yep. every gym's gonna deal with an attrition rate. <clears throat> I know that there are some people behind me anxiously wanting me to uh, waiting to see how I speak on this. Well, they're gonna like some of the other questions I have too. <sighs> <laughs> but you're talking to me not that i know honestly we don't deal with as much as you think we do um <clears throat> it's usually you take this for whatever it's worth the turnover we have is usually the boys mm -hmm. and it's not because of the lifting it's not because of the grind. It's not because of injuries. It's because of women. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Be Louis, yeah, Louis used to. Say, well, I don't want to get in with. You know yeah, what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah. You've probably seen this oh, yourself yeah. enough throughout the years with the girls that I have. It's never that. Mm -hmm. Um. And it's not. I know the boys have shirts that say we don't matter as a joke mm -hmm. that they wear to meets. Yeah. They do matter. But the girls are the more consistent people in the gym that are constantly not fucking up, making my life difficult, allowing dumb shit to happen. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Women are so much different to coach than, than men. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. And I'm sure that you've seen that yeah. yourself throughout the years. We do not have a lot of turnover. Um, a majority of the people sitting behind me have been at my gym 10 years plus, you know, mm -hmm. um, I do not invite people to come to my gym to train. I don't reach out to people. They reach out to me. Mm -hmm. I explain to them the situation, how this works. It's a private facility. We're a competition competing powerlifting team. We travel, you know, I'm the voice if you've ever had a coach in your life of any kind softball football wrestling it doesn't matter that's how this works just like you would used to be with your coach mm -hmm. if you've never played sports and don't know how that works this is how it works it's not a democracy i call the shots in here um so we don't have a lot of changeover um we have a pretty consistently the same people that we've had for years it's it's crazy difficult to get new blood into this sport, especially where I live and where we're at because we're such a small town. Um, I, I don't know what it is. I can't put my finger on it. Um, there are some talented individuals that are in our community. Don't get me wrong. I would love to have, I would love to get my hands on them. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I would, but I know why they don't come to me. I know why they don't come to our gym. They like going to these public facilities with the mirrors, with the cameras, you know, having a good, they're, they're not that dedicated. You know what I'm saying? 
everybody wants to be strong until they lift those heavy ass weights. Isn't that mm -hmm. what Ronnie used to say? Mm -hmm. And that's true. We have had people come in our gym, especially guys. And I do this intentionally. I put them with the women. That's not to demoralize them whatsoever. I know that they're not catching us guys that have been there for years. We're more advanced. We, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I just want to see how they do with the girls. Well, these girls take that shit seriously. They punish these boys. You know what I'm saying? And then they're seeing all these women in here squatting 500 pounds and pulling 400 pounds and Melissa and Shelly, you know, putting up these crazy numbers geared. And they're like, what the fuck is going on in here? I can't keep up with these girls. We've had guys come in there and walk outside throwing up, just deadlifting, mm -hmm. you know? <clears throat> It's, it's a, I wished we could get new blood. Several of us guys talk all the time. I wished we could get some new guys in here. It's always the women that search us out because they are seeing these other women in the progression that they make. We don't have a hen house. You know, we don't have all this infighting and, you know, a bunch of women at each other's throat or nothing like that. They all get along. They all support one another. And these other women see that and they're they can come to a gym and not be hit on by men you know going to a public gym you know that's going to happen mm -hmm. they're not being judged i have all body types at my gym we have 114 to 242 you know and these women are not being judged they're not being hit on they're being respected and these other women get to see these heroic things that these women are doing with children at their age, their jobs, and they're like, man, I want to come in there and get some of that action. And they do great with it. So you don't have people that are in town for the summer and then they go back to school? No. All right, so because that's something a lot of crews are kind of dying anyhow, right? So it, just We're one of the crew, last Mohicans, brother. There, there's not a lot, right? So, yeah. and, it, and I don't know why that is. You know, I, have, I have my I have opinions. ideas and opinions. Yeah but I can't really say as to why that is, but I can tell you, what do you think? What are your internet, opinions? The fucking internet has killed powerlifting. How so? People think in my opinion of watching and observing that they watch this dude on Instagram. They watch this person on YouTube and, and if he can do that, I can do that. I can pay for this coach that's giving every single other motherfucker the same damn template to go by, you know, and I can do this from home. I don't need to be around these. They're... The thing that I feel that's missing nowadays is competition and competing uh, within a group. Mm -hmm. You were in a group at Westside. Mm -hmm. You cannot tell me that you motherfuckers weren't in there trying to kill each other. I've been in a group since I started. But you see what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I have that with this group. They're not as loud and obnoxious and whatever you want to call it that I am. So I create it in there sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. like, Katie, you going to let Anika damn out deadlift yeah, yeah, you yeah, today? Yeah. What's going on with you, girl? Step your mm -hmm. fucking game up. They are very competitive with one another, but you can't, I, I've just, I have seen so many people come into our gym that are younger. They don't want to be pushed. They don't want to be, they don't want to be, you know, shit talked. You know, we have a very older group, so we're used to some shit talking, mm -hmm. some razzing your ass, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I just think that we have a, uh, unfortunately, not everybody, I just think that we have a very weaker society than what we had when we were younger that don't like to be pushed and coached hard. You know, and that's what I do. I'm not, I'm harder on Melissa than I am any other lifter in that damn building. And it doesn't matter that she's my wife. I have expectations for her. I have expectations for Dylan. I ride them. I want them to be the best that they can be. And not a lot of people can take what I give as a coach, but I don't want those people there at my gym anyways. So how, I mean, how exactly has the internet made that happen? Though? That's what I'm saying. It allows people to cower and live in their little basement gym or go to their little public facilities and they don't have to answer to nobody. You know, they love posting these videos of, you know, them doing their bicep curls and, you know, doing this and doing that. And they're not committed to anything. They don't have the competition. Nobody judges anybody anymore. 
you know, and on the internet, you got to be careful with what you say. You don't want to hurt nobody's feelings. In my gym, I don't give a fuck about that. We're trying to create champions. We're trying to create real lifters. I want, I learn more about an individual in my gym every day than I could ever learn about them in real life. How they act, how they carry themselves, how they, how they deal with defeat, how they deal with success. Are they a quitter? What are they made out of mentally? How strong mentally are these individuals? You don't get to see that outside of a gym. You get to see it in there when you're in the midst and you get to see somebody miss a lift. Did they miss it because they're not strong enough or just was it technique or was they just not feeling it today? And I get to see some of these people in my gym battle through that and come back. And now I'm like, man, this is fucking awesome seeing them continue to have success when obstacles mm -hmm. happen. You know, Dylan is a full blown diabetic, born a diabetic. He could use that excuse every day not to come to that gym because he deals with all kinds of medical problems. But that boy comes in there, works all day, does what he does, trains hard, does exactly what I ask of him, and I ride his fucking ass. And he takes it. There's not a lot of kids his age that could deal with that because they don't want to deal with that. We've just gotten a little bit soft. And they maybe say, oh, Joey, you're just an old, old meathead and... You know, and all that, but I don't think that that's, that's it at all. I think we've just gotten soft, and a lot of people don't want to be in a real training group where competition is the real deal. Failures are reality. The internet, everything's make believe, everything's roses and rainbows. Do you ever post yet a negative about yourself? No, you're always posting something great about yourself. And that's what the internet has given people in the gym, in a group, in a true, power uh, true power lifting team that's competitive that ain't always the case there is losses and misses and deficiencies and problems that continue to happen but that maturation allows them to grow mentally stronger not just physically stronger and i think that's what's missing today with a lot of lifters in this age bracket that's just my opinion it is but it, i mean it's and I, I agree, right? So the, the, this is the, the crazy part. I agree, but I also like to question why yeah. the opposite of what I would think is <clears throat> the contradiction to that would be the sport's bigger than it's ever, ever been by hundreds of thousands True. of lifters. That's the positive side of the internet. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's like, could it be, could that way be wrong if now they're, they're all stronger by a lot? You know, so the lifters are stronger. Well, let's be careful what we say. All. Well, not all. Yeah. 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 But, a lot. Yeah. But the, the hard thing to figure out is, yes, the sport's grown tenfold. Maybe, Without a doubt. Maybe, maybe even more than tenfold. But what's hard to tell is how many do one meet and leave, right? That's the mm. tricky part, right? Mm. You probably, There's and, a lot of flashes in the pan. Yeah. And um, and I, I don't know what that attrition rate was. 15 years ago. We wouldn't have had the metrics to know it. Yeah, exactly. So you don't. So you don't know matter how many come in and leave because if you look at open powerlifting, the total number of lifters, and you just start randomly clicking around, like go to the bottom of any weight class and just start randomly click around. One meet, one meet, one meet, one meet, one meet, one meet. Yeah. Like, okay, it's, it's still that grows the sport because right? more people are coming in, but they're not sticking. So are they not sticking because there's not crews? You know, I would say that would be my opinion. Maybe they are because they're not associated with a group to be a community to be able to make them want to stick. Or maybe it's just like a college student that went to school to be a, a dentist. And he's like, maybe this is not what I really wanted to do. Could be. I mean, there's a, there's lot. a lot of variables. I mean, the, if you look at the number of high school powerlifters, it's insane. Especially when you look at that. Texas, Texas, that is crazy. Jersey, all I mean, it's crazy. Yeah, but a very, very, very small percentage ever compete after that. You know, so that's true. Why? You know, that, that that's something I've been. Now, people will say, well, the, the reason why is the same reason why if you play lacrosse in college or, or in high school or soccer in high school, you don't join a club team. You just associate it with high school. Right. And I'm like, well, I'm, I don't know. You know, it's. Fortunately, fortunately, I suppose when I competed in high school, I was told to never compete in those meets, to compete in <laughs> really? other meets. Oh, 100%. Wow. Always, yes, 100%. And um, 
and compete in other meets. But then that, uh, that made me associated with a different community, you know, community that wasn't just, this is what we do in high school. Then after high school, you don't do that. Yeah. You know, a community of shit. I'm just a teenager lifting against these fucking grown ass men, get my ass kicked, you know, in this APF route or whatever it was yeah. where, but at, everybody I speak to that, you know, they want to see crews come back, but I don't know if that's the case because even in power, cause there's more powerlifting gyms too. If you were to call them power, you know, what they, I would say they're power. So gyms are for power and they might have five combo racks. And then you go in there and you'll have five lifters all using a, a different combo rack. Yeah. You know, they don't train together. So, you know, that's, I think it depends on a couple of variables. Crews that I'm used to seeing are primarily geared crews because you have to have a crew to train in gear. Mm -hmm. A lot of raw lifters don't have to have a crew. Mm -hmm. You know, you need a, you need a rack, you need a bar, you need a bench, maybe not even need a bench. If you've got a setup on a rack that you can bench out of. Um, most of the crews that I've seen throughout my lifetime, are always been primarily geared crews because you have to have help doing geared lifts mm -hmm. or you're going to get fucking killed. I've never, honestly, and I've been to a lot of gyms, n not as much as you, but I've been to a lot of gyms across the country and I've never seen a raw crew. Now I'm not saying they don't exist. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is raw lifting can be done primarily a lot alone. You mm -hmm. don't need a crew. But the geared side of it, because you know as well as I do, in the world of powerlifting, geared lifting is a spec. Raw lifting dominates oh, like crazy. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, there's thousands upon thousands upon thousands of raw lifters out there because it's much easier to do. Mm -hmm. And you can do it by yourself. You don't have to have a fucking crew. But geared lifting, that's a whole nother different animal. You have to have a crew. So that's just my opinion of a lot of the deteriorating crews you and I are becoming relics. But if I go back further, though, to when I came in and it's single ply and I can put the shit on myself, there were crews. Yeah. But I, I think that there might have been crews then because there wasn't choices. There wasn't raw, single ply, multi ply, unlimited. Yeah. It was just this. Well, I think, it, I mean, for me, it was more about this is just when they trained. And they were the ones that can help me get better. Right? Yeah. They're spotters, you know, so it's, it didn't make sense in my brain. Like, well, we why? weren't sitting around playing video games and on the internet all day either. Well, it's. In those days. Yeah. You know, and it's, we played outside and rode bicycles and went in the woods and, you know, shit like that. That's not what happened nowadays. Still though, if somebody's coming into a sport that's new, right? The only way you could really learn it was going to be from somebody else mm. where now they can learn it online i suppose yeah right so i suppose that's i suppose you know and it's because i remember like reading hatfield's powerlifting book for the first time and he's like writing and there's like four pictures on how to how to squat right and like one thing i didn't think about like oh shit i didn't think about that so then you go do that so you're trying to figure this shit out yeah. by that then the guys that you train with as well are like do this do this do that and um that was it was harder to find that information you had to buy the book yes or you had that power lifting you say you had to somebody around you had to wait yeah now you know you can find it like that actually yeah. you can find twenty five hundred thousand different ways to squat just like that yeah you know which which changes that dynamic as well so it's it's a it's a weird thing because i think that if most people knew if if most lifters knew how it could benefit them they would do it Yes. But they've never done it because they don't know what the value of it is yeah. because they've never had it. Training with a crew, there is so many fucking benefits of it. You don't have to, like, I've always heard you say in the past with your crew at Westside, you guys really didn't do a lot of shit together outside the gym. Hmm. Most of you fucking hated each other. You know, I've never been in that sort of environment, but you made it work because each of you knew that the benefit of being together and the competition of that atmosphere with everybody in there was going to make you stronger. Mm -hmm. I, and I used to train in a crew similar to that 
I didn't do with anything with any of those people, you know, with those crews back in the day. I just wanted to learn from them. And there was such an abundance of experience with all of those guys that I trained with. Each of them was highly beneficial to me in some way, one way or another. I just didn't learn everything from one guy. Yeah, yeah. I could take something from everybody in there, you know, it, it, as minuscule as uh, uh, mentally approaching the bar. Um, there was somebody that I picked up something from that I still use today is visualization. Mm -hmm. Let's see, how can I explain this? Seeing the lift before you do the lift, mm -hmm. um, visualizing it constantly. I am a true believer, and, and this individual taught me this. Not, not taught me, but he spoke about it so much that I thought to myself, that's a really good idea. Not that that's, you know, some brand new thought or something, but... I try to tell all of my lifters all the time, when you are getting ready and prepared for a lift, to visually see yourself, all your cues, how you set up hand placement, feet placement, hip placement, traps, this, that, breathing, da-da-da-da-da. And then the most important part is see you completing that lift successfully, mm -hmm. training your brain over and over again. And that's one thing that I took from somebody years ago in a group, and that's the only thing that he ever gave me, but I thought it was very valuable. I'd say there's there's two benefits, big benefits of being in a group, or being in around like-minded people. Let's let's define it that okay. way. Being around like-minded people, because that applies to everything. Yes. Outside of powerlifting, it applies to everything. <laughs> if you're around like-minded people, there's energy within a group. Oh yes. yeah. So if, if, if you ever played football and you're in the locker room before a game, one person starts to get hyped. What happens to everybody else? It all goes up, you mm -hmm. know. One people, one person sitting there doesn't. There, so there's energy. Oh yeah, I don't know how to define with that. There's energy with that. Then the second thing is when you're around like-minded people, you become like the people you're around. One hundred percent. Right. So you are the people you surround. You're yourself covering with. something that I was going to say yeah, next. You see what I'm saying? The so, atmosphere that you're around starts creating something for everybody because everybody's on the same wavelength. Yes. Now that being around those like-minded people. I do think can be replicated online. You know, if people are communicating with each other that are top lifters and they're tossing ideas back and forth the same oh, way yeah, that we You're being specific top lift. Yes, I agree with that. Yeah, because they are. They're yeah. communicating mm -hmm. and it's like, hey, look at this. Look I agree at this. with that. And so that, that part of that can be replicated. That energy part, though, mm -mm. it can't. No, it cannot. Right? And it's, that's where my brain goes. Is that good or bad? Because sometimes that energy can lead to shit in the gym with, hey, back the fuck down. Yep. That wouldn't have happened if they were by themselves. No. Right? I agree 100%. So, yeah. So there's that. It's like, ah, oh, fuck. I don't know really what I think about that. You know, I bounce back and forth. But it, if I had the option of the two, I'd rather have that. Right? Because what mm -hmm. about those days when I feel like shit? You know, then you need that energy to be able to pull through. You yeah. need that energy to lock out something real heavy that you may have not locked out before. That's that, those competitive vibes that start coming through when that energy is picking up. Yeah. So that's another level. Yeah. That's definitely another level that, you know, you're not, you don't want to miss this motherfucker mm -hmm. because somebody else just in it. So that's, yeah. you know, that, oh, I know. That, yeah, that's a different, that's a different thing. And what I fight with is, you know, when you have kids and stuff like that, you're trying to figure out like, how do you get them around like-minded people? Right. How do you keep them around the people you don't want them, you, you know, keep them from being around the people you don't want them around? Yeah. You know, and all these. That's a hard one. It's a tough motherfucker. Right. Yeah. So it's the same thing kind of plays out. Like, how do you if you got a lifter, that's a great lifter. You know, how do you keep them from being fucked by all the stupid dumbasses that can pull them back and yeah. all those other type of things? Because they're all they're all over the place. They are influence, and, bad influences. Do you have people that come in? randomly like the once a month visitor no. or no you're either here or you're not mm -hmm. now there is an individual or two that we have that is not there as much as we would like them to be but those kind of things are what they are mm -hmm. and they have been teammates for 20 years and just sort of is what it is mm -hmm. um we can function with or without them but that can be good and bad it though. can be it, it yes it, it can, yeah. That was, I mean, that was, that was one thing. <clears throat> I know that was one thing that Louie wanted, you know, say for me after I left. Like, why in the fuck doesn't he just hang around a bit? But, like, do they really want to see this cripple fucker? You know, as, you know, so there's like, and I don't want to be there if I can't do it. 
Right. You know, so I see the value. That's what I'm saying. It can be good and bad. I see the value, but I also see the devalue yep. of that. Um, looking back, being older, there's probably more value than the devalue because if they if they give a fuck, that's that's the other thing. They need to give a fuck. Like if they're yeah. showing up once a month, but actually give a fuck. And they've been there for 20 years. That's yeah. a set of eyes, a fresh set of eyes. It's like what's his name that used to hand off for Hoff, um, the ball head. Bob, yeah. Bob, yeah. Co. Uh, yeah. I mean, he wasn't a shell of anything that he used to be, but his energy, his support, his, you know, love for the sport and him being involved how he was, he had to be one of the most valuable individuals in that gym that didn't train. Yeah, well, it's a fresh set of eyes. Yes. You know, it's things can go, even in a crew, even a tight crew, things can go unnoticed for a while. Yeah. Just because you become kind of immune Com to it. Complacent. Yeah. And then, you know, two months later, you're like, what the fuck? Like, why is the bar two, uh, an inch and a half off center? Yep. And then you go look at the videos like, motherfucker, it's been that way. Nobody noted, like, what the fuck? Right. You know, you just become complacent to the whole, but that fresh set of eyes is going to come in and be like, yeah. like, what the fuck? We have, a, we have an individual that I wished was still there. He's like, he would be our Bob Co, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And that's Redneck Tim, who I spoke about earlier. Every one of these individuals know, man, one of the greatest training partners I've ever had in my entire life. And I've trained with some great people throughout my lifetime. The problem with him is that it wasn't that he got broken or beat up or his pride got in the way because he couldn't hang anymore. And I tried for so many years to be like, look, man, you are such an asset to this team. Just your presence in here is such an asset to so many individuals. He didn't realize his worth outside of the weights he could lift. And that was such a setback for me because he was impossible to replace. Mm -hmm. and still is he was a complete absolute veteran he knew how to do everything in there he helped me devise so many tactics and methods and things that we did he 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 had that eye you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. he was the one he could point out things that i may miss or i didn't see and the support that he brought and the energy he brought was irreplaceable irreplaceable I would do anything to have him back in there. Mm -hmm. So I get what you're saying. Yeah. He was one of those that his lifting didn't do the talking anymore, but his experience as an individual in that facility was you could not put a price on it. I just hate that he's not there anymore. Are there other people that came in that you saw had a lot of talent, but then just <laughs> faded away? You don't have to say who they were, but then just nah. faded away. I don't have to say who they are because those names are resonating through their minds into mine right now. Mm -hmm. We have had a ton, a ton of talented individuals that were, you know, it just wasn't their cup of tea anymore. You know, I guess sometimes as a coach, you may want this more than they want it for themselves because you see the potential. You see the man. What if this kid really got serious? You see it and you know it. And just the what ifs are gone and disappeared now. But we've had several of those, you know, and those were local individuals that could have been absolute champions, serious contenders. What pulled them away? <laughs> Personal Personal demons. That's, I, I don't know. I mean, I could. When you can't you say that's what brought them in? Not really. Not really. Um, I wouldn't say that at all. Um, I think most people in the beginning are want they want to be a part of something. They want to be a part of something greater than themselves, and they see what we have, and they see where we go, and they see what we do, and. They, it's like anything. Everybody always sees the finished product. They don't see the work that was going into what you have become. They don't see the reps. They don't see the injuries. They don't see the failures. Um, they don't see the development. They don't see the time. They don't see the uh, sacrifices. They just see the final product of what they see right then. And they think, I want to be that. But then they start seeing what it took to become that. 
and they're not they're not about that life and that's unfortunate because they have the abilities i've always said this about individuals that that are born with talent you have individuals in life that say some guy is born to play the guitar he was just an automatic ace as soon as he picked it up he knew how to do it didn't take a lot of practice he was just great at it then you've got a guy that is not a musician whatsoever and he tries his damnedest to want to learn how to play that guitar so he's putting in the hours he's putting in the time he's putting in the effort he's putting in the sacrifice while the other guy is just relying on the talent that he has and takes it for granted me as a coach i want that motherfucker that's working harder that doesn't have that talent that god-given gift than that dude that takes that ability for granted and i've had more of this than i have of that and that's unfortunate because I'll take that hard working shit every single day over a talented individual that takes that shit for granted. Because if I, I, I've had a couple of people that have sort of had that, that have started to reach this apex of greatness and then poof, they're gone. But I'm sure you've seen that throughout your life as well. I'm sure there are lifters that you have trained with. You thought, man, if this motherfucker ever got serious, mm -hmm. he'd be the shit. How long does it take for that to happen? <sighs> with the guys that just off the, I know it's hard to kind of lay down, but a year, two years. Man, that's such a hard answer because it's. Well, it, you, anything under six months don't, you, don't even no, bother No, I mean, with there, that. There, there's years involved. Yeah, yeah, there's years there's involved. There's years involved. I, for, for me, I'm going to, if I was to throw it out there, I'm going to say it's, it's like two and a half years, three years. Yeah, I'm right in okay. there with you. I've said it a million times. I, I do not want a made lifter at my gym. I don't. I don't, I don't want that because they are already programmed into what they do, how they do it how their brain is functioning. They already are predetermined what works, what don't. You know, it's going to be hard to break them, you know, to to make them better. I would rather have the most uncoordinated, two left-footed fucking person that's never played a sport in their goddamn life in my gym. Look, I'm not just saying this because she's my wife. I'm saying this because this is the truth. Melissa walked in our facility at 105 pounds at 39 years old, never lifted a fucking weight in her entire damn life. There's not a harder worker at my gym than her. She has zero athletic ability. That's not me being mean. I'm just telling you what the fuck it is. I have watched her maturation over the past 10 years become one of the best multiply lifters in the entire world. Her first meet, this is what I'm getting back to, the person with the least amount of talent, but the hardest motherfucking worker in the group. That has been her, her entire career at the gym. First meet, 105 squat. She missed the bar on her bench twice, hit it on her third attempt, just the bar, pulled like 185. This woman is currently the number two ranked all-time female squatter for her age and weight class in the history of the sport with a 550 squat. Shelly is now squatting 672 pounds and benching 450. Her and I grew up together since we were 11 years old. She, she claims that cheerleading is a sport, but I don't. <laughs> but that was her athletic, you know, uh, ability in her mind. Dylan, he is a, he's, an, he's an athlete. He wrestled in school and stuff like that. But he did not have the ability of some of the other guys that came to my gym. But because of his hardworking mentality, that kid don't quit. He's there every fucking day. He works harder than everybody else. And the best part is he listens. And that's hard to find as a coach that lifters that going to listen. And you know what I'm saying? They listen and they believe in what's going on. I, I have some of the best lifters in my life that I've ever coached or been around because I have got to watch maturation for over decades with them and see and know what they have become. And I will always take that person that is not athletic, that is not a made lifter, over somebody that can already bench 500, pull 800. I've had those before. It don't fucking work. They're too hard-headed. They don't want to change. 
And even when I have them become better than what they are, and they know this, I've had made lifters come into my gym. I have increased their totals and their lifts. And when they left, they could not duplicate what they did when they were there with us. It's different when you train with a bunch of people that are hardworking, that are willing to sacrifice the support system that we provide one another. It's different. It's different. I don't compare our gym to anybody else because we're not like anybody else. We are a gym. We are a team. But I consider what we have as being a family first. It's just different. From what, I, what I've seen is, you know, if we're going to divide people and the two groups, like you said, like a hardworking group and the genetic group, <clears throat> they both hit the same thing at about two and a half, three years. It's when it gets hard. Yes. Right? Shit gets hard. Shit gets hard. It's, it's fucking easy yep. for a few years. Those those newbie gains are easy. Yeah. Yeah, even when you get in the sport and you start refining technique, gains come quicker because yep. you're getting, you fix your technique a little bit, 100 pounds can go on a lift. You know, yeah. just, it, then you hit that, that two and a half, three year mark, then it's like, fuck. Then it's hard. Yep. Really hard. And some people can't push through that. Mm -mm. You know, and it's, I think it was the first podcast I did with Hoff where, you know, his observation of all the years he's at the West Side, he could see it. Yeah. You know, because he was younger. So he's seeing everybody above him. So they would get strong for a couple of years, then they plateaued for a couple of years, and then tr they would get strong again, then they plateau, then they get strong again. So he knew every time he felt like he was plateaued, just got to ride this out, just ride it out. And then, and actually even back off just a little bit, yes. you know, to understand this is this, I'm now in that phase. Yep. So maybe I'm going to total about the same, you know, for a fucking two years. Yeah. And then boom, it will go again. And that's when he would see people drop. It's like they hit that, they, they plateau, like, fuck, I guess I'm I gave done. up. You know, so the question becomes how many plateaus do you have until you're actually really done? You know, couldn't Probably use that aspect in many ways of life. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, when you fall apart, you know, mm -hmm. it depends on the what that mentality is. It, I think that the ones that it comes easier to when they hit that point, now they're at this high national level, right? So they can't deal with the fact that now they're here. Yeah. And it's that where the other ones are hitting that point at a more novice level. Yeah. And it's like they know they can get better or should be able to get better because they've seen everybody else get better above them. Mm -hmm. They just need to figure it out. Right. The other ones, I don't know if they figure it out. You know, it's, and just through my own path, I think I hit that before coming to West side. Cause it was like two, three years. And it's like the third time it got stuck like that. I'm like, fuck, am I done? Yeah. Like, can I, is this it? You know, yeah. I had professors telling me that you're your genetic ceiling. I'm like, Jesus Christ, man. All I do is get fucking broke. And there was, there, there was, there was more, there was a fucking lot more, you know, after that, you just had to write it out, figure it out, change things, get around other people, Yep. you know, like, minded. yes, you know, change your group, change everything and change your own mind. Like if now, now things are different. Like this, for me, it was like, this is a hobby. This is I'm not always serious about it, but this now has to change. Yeah, this has to, where I thought I was really all in before. Now this has to I have to redefine what that really means if I want to get better, you know, get better through that. That's tough. It is. Right. So I think it's more genetically minded than it is genetically physically, you know, physical, you know, somebody that's had adversity or had to overcome adversity already knows how to overcome adversity when that happens. Yeah. Somebody that doesn't really know how to overcome adversity is like, fuck, they don't know. Well, I'm lucky. I have a lot of individuals in my gym that's had to overcome a lot of fucking adversity. Yeah, so if their bench don't go up for a little while, what the fuck does that mean to them? Yeah, Katie. You know, they've had to deal with a lot of other yeah. shit, you know, to be able to deal with that. Yep. Or for speculating, for some people, that may be the biggest adversity they ever had. Yeah. Their total's not getting any bigger. Yeah, I, I've not really had to deal with a lot yeah. of that. I mean, I, I, I have such a diverse group of individuals that's, you know, everybody's got their story. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, there's nobody that comes to mind in my group whatsoever that hasn't dealt with some serious diversity in their life. Mm -hmm. And I think that that truly helps because, you know, you're not going to make every shot more metaphorically speaking, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But you're going to miss every shot you don't take too. you know? So my job is not just to teach technique and teach training methodology to teach you how to get stronger. I speak to each of my lifters by themselves a lot 
whether through text, whether through phone call, whether through it's just one-on-one -on -one at the gym, I need them to believe in themselves. You know, sometimes somebody just needs them to believe in themselves to help them move forward. Confidence issues. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I think when they, throughout the years, what I've seen, if I can make, help them believe in themselves with my belief in them, I tell every lifter in there, I'm not putting weight on the bar that I don't think you can take. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And sometimes they're like, man, I don't know if I can do this or not. I know that they're feeling that way. But then when they see it time after time after time after time, they start having that confidence and they're breaking mental barriers every single time. Now, do I have lifters in here that make mistakes at meets or miss lifts because of some bullshit technical cue? Of course. You're never going to be perfect. But the belief system and the support system that we have in our gym for one another it helps so, so much that you have somebody that has your back mentally, physically, and doesn't want you to fail. I know for me, mentally, having everybody's support. I don't know if you ever watch any of our videos. There is so much noise going on during lifts. You hear cues. <laughs> it's, we sound like a synchronized swimming team if they made noise. You hear everything that's going on, and we're all used to it. And then once that lift is made, every person in that gym is absolutely ecstatic for that lifter at that moment when they are successful at what they're doing. I watch videos of people all the time, and I never see camaraderie, handshakes, high fives. Not that you need to slap everybody's asses all the time. Or maybe because people think they're too fucking hardcore, and, you know, I don't need to congratulate that motherfucker. But in our gym, I'm telling you, we are successful for a reason. And I think when you're in an environment of, like you said, people that are like-minded, that are on the same path, that want the same things, that strive for the same success, together as a unit, I know this is going to sound corny. I've used this phrase a couple of times, but individually, you are a raindrop. But together, we are a hurricane. I don't think as a team... I would put us against anybody as a team, what we can accomplish individually. The support system we have for one another is unbelievable. You just have to be in that environment. And the reason I'm touching on this so much is because what we are talking about, how that environment impacts the group as a whole, the competitiveness, um, the, the winning attitude. You know what I'm saying? We are very deep into that. I mean, don't get it twisted. These girls in here are fucking crazy competitive with one another. They know if they can beat one of our top girls in the gym, they're going to have a pretty damn good chance at the next meet to beat somebody. You know what I'm saying? It's You're not just building individuals to get strong. You're building a... Uh, let's see, how can I explain this? You, you may have to help me on this, what I'm trying to say. I'm, I, I'm building um, a, 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 a strength barrier mentally to believe in what we're doing and that you're going to be successful. Um, I don't see people that are successful that don't have a great support system or don't believe in themselves. Sometimes people think, oh, man, those people are just some cocky, arrogant fucking person, when really that's actually called confidence. You just don't have it, so it appears as being arrogant to you. We have confidence because we believe in one another, and they believe in me, and they trust me. And I think that that matters a whole lot in success, whether it's a business, whether it's a gym, whether it's a family, anything. I think as long as everybody's on the same page and believes in one another, you can be fully successful in anything you do. I think the word you're looking for would be character. Yes. There we go. <clears throat> so it builds character. Yeah, it does. You know, from that may sound corny, but. Well, I mean, where it's, for a lot of people, where else are they going to build it? Yeah. Right, because then that will transfer over to their life, their job. Yes. You know, all these other types exactly. of things. Exactly, 100%. You know, where I've always said 99% of the gym 
training can carry over to your life. You're 100% correct. The, the 1% that doesn't carry over very well is the selfishness. Yeah. You know, that, so, yeah. you know, that, that, that's the tough part because, yeah. but if you're working within that team crew environment, then that's taken care of, yep. you know, that should carry over with that. And then, <clears throat> Getting back to the women in the sport, because you have predominantly mostly women. And then when you came into the sport, I mean, if we go back that far, women might have constituted like two people in one flight, three people in one yeah. flight. Now you go to a meet and it's probably half the meet. Yep. So how, why do you think that is first off? And then where do you think that trajectory of the sport goes? Well, this is where I'll say I think that the Internet has helped the sport. Women are getting to see women all over the Internet do things that people thought were impossible years ago. You know, you're able to see it immediately, search it out, look at, follow people. And, you know, sometimes all people need to do is see somebody else do something and think, shit, I'd like to be able to do that. And mm -hmm. I think that women have watched. An, this is where I think social media is a benefit you these girls have gotten to watch and see these other women and be inspired you know and push themselves because they see it can be done i mean whoever thought that becca squats and squat would ever be beat by mm -hmm. anybody i mean let's just be realistic and then here comes leah into the mix and watching her evolve through the years you know, I said to myself one time, if there's somebody that's going to be able to do it, I think this is the one. And I never thought that of anybody else. There's never been anybody in the sport that was like, there ain't nobody going to beat Becca. You know? So I think I think the, the internet and social media on that front has helped tremendously with the sport of powerlifting. Um, we just had our very first meet in North Carolina history um, last month of a female-only powerlifting meet in North Carolina, which was fantastic. I mean, I think there was 40 women from all over. Um, and that was awesome to see. You're raw and geared, you know. Um, Laura's been doing that for years in Cincinnati. We have went and competed in two or three women's pro-ams, and that thing has exponentially grown crazy. Now it's a two-day event. Mm -hmm. And I remember the first time that we had logged on, we were all sitting at at our house with laptops in front of us waiting for it to open. And as soon as it opened, we were all panicking, you know, trying to get everything typed in to, you know, get registered for the meet. That fucking meet sold out in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. and I was like, Jesus Christ. Holy crap. I've never seen anything like that in my life. And now it's continued to grow. And I just think things like that are have have taken a small step when she first started that, and it's grown and it's grown and it's grown and it's grown. You know, you've got women pulling six hundreds, you've got women benching, you know, five six hundred. You've got you know Leah squatting over nine. You've got all these strong ass raw female power lifters all over the. I mean, just crazy shit. I watched one of, uh, um, what's his name? Ah, shit. One of his lifters out of Georgia, part of elite. Anyways, she pulled like 460 for 10 reps raw the other day. Oh, Steve? Yes. Yes. I thought, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. and, and that was after pulling like 430 for 10 reps or some shit, you know? I mean, stuff like that is mind-boggling what females are doing right now, you know. And I think that that's where social media and the Internet itself is putting a light on it. And it's inspiring more women to get into the sport. And, you know, most of them are starting out raw or, you know, something like that. But, you know, it's growing. And I'm glad to see it's growing. It's, it's, it's pulling more in. And even just on the male side, I mean, there's – there's there's raw guys squatting over a grant. Yeah, you know, there's raw guys benching seven. I mean, it's mm -hmm. like the the numbers where they're more comprehensible to people that are coming in. 
Yeah. Like, so you come in, I mean, I remember, you know, Louis used to have, you know, here's the 800 pound squat list. Well, fuck people, I'd have to look, but probably There's hundreds a lot. of fucking doing that raw. 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 Yeah. You know, right now. <laughs> where that was something that was aspirational. Yeah. Like I want to get on that list. And then at the time there were like four people on the 900 list and like Matt didn't want a thousand pound list. Yeah. And then slowly those creep up. And now I look and like, holy fuck, there's raw people that are destroying all of that. Yeah. And, but if that's what they see, you know, they go online, it's like, well, fuck, he's doing it. 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 It's like when I first went into the gym, the very first time, a powerlifting gym, 12 and a half years old, there's people benching three, 400 pounds. That was, I'm thinking that's fucking, no, I'm thinking that's fucking normal. I don't see it. It's also, I never, it's not like I saw people benching 135. Yeah. Like, well, fuck, I guess, you know, this, to me, 315 is no big deal. I just, your expectations change because of yeah. what you see right now people they get interested in the sport they go on instagram or whatever it is their expectations are going to see all these other lifts yeah but the problem that they're not putting in comprehending that's four or five people on the fucking planet that's doing that mm-hmm. squatting a thousand raw oh yeah 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 you know yeah, what i'm yeah, saying yeah but that makes the 800 not look so big i i agree but see like me i still think of because i'm old school mm-hmm. i can't help who i am I still think a 700 fucking raw squat is fucking awesome. Well, it is. I, I do. It is. I mean, it still is. Yeah, I mean, but it is. But to this younger generation that's been so capsized by these bigger squats, they're like. It's a stepping stone. Yeah, and, stepping yes, stone. And to me, the, to me, my perception is the deadlift has surpassed the bench as far as popularity. So now people go out and they're seeing all these guys pulling 700, 800. 900 they're seeing all these lists so every every fucking it kid on if you're doing it sumo or conventional right well it does but i mean fucking every kid that <laughs> it doesn't I, matter yeah, man, every kid i funny. speak to under 20 yeah wants to fucking pull 700 good luck you know, to them they, fuck they, the deadlift yeah well, it's old school right yeah and but that's 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 growing it exponentially too because their their expectations yeah are higher than us waiting for a magazine to come out and then the magazine comes out like holy fuck and we're so fucking behind on really what's going on because we've only got that magazine every few months to even get us somewhat updated to what's happening in the world yeah yeah where today you know immediately a meet happening right now you're everybody knows yes it was like when jimmy cole hit that 1400 pound bench i knew five minutes after it happened Mm-hmm. somebody had already messaged me and i was like what mm-hmm. you know that's the thing with the internet nowadays crazy and then the video's up within yeah minutes. 20 minutes yeah you know it's like holy there there it is yeah there it is, yeah, there you, it is. you know it's cr- so there's there's that you know so with the good's always going to come the bad yeah you know where i don't know how to balance that you know if i kind of go through that right yeah. because i don't want to <clears throat> you're older now so now you're that guy on the other side of the table that's how i explain it like now you're the guy on the other side of the table like if, when I was 20, people were telling me shit, you know, that were washed up meatheads. I'm like, shut the fuck up. Well, you can't lift shit anymore. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Now you're that guy. And so it's like, how do you change your message, you know, to be able to still relate to that person? I'm not that guy yet, Dave. Oh, I am. I'm I not am. that yeah. guy yet. Yeah. I'm yeah. still fucking some people up. Yeah. But it's that, that message, though, of the experience of being through that when you're going to those kids you got to remember or the younger ones you got to remember you did dumber shit than they're probably oh god doing. without a doubt see that's the thing that I, I also explain to especially to the boys y'all are getting to hurdle all of the dumb shit that i did you know what i'm saying yeah the dumb shit that you don't have to deal with because i don't allow it you know what i'm saying they know if they go outside of the parameters of what i'm asking or what i'm wanting there's going to be some fucking repercussions over that because I'm running a tight ship on, because I know, I know what's going to get you fucked up. There is nobody in that fucking gym that's ever taken a main lift without me being there. Never, ever. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So back to what you were saying, but um, <sighs> reel me in, but back to what you were saying, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I just wanted to explain, you know, that, even if you still don't have it as a top flight lifter, your experience and knowledge is still king. They just need to understand that. Well, they do, right? But when go back to when you were 22, 
right? And then no, somebody Lord. was sitting across. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Somebody sitting across from you, and they're saying, "Look, man, what you're doing is fucking stupid." Fuck and you're that thinking, guy. shut the fuck up. Yeah, fuck same, that guy. Same situation, right? As we get older, we become that guy. Yeah. But as long as we remember what it was like when we were that dumb fuck, right? <laughs> then that message can be different yeah. than the message and how they were telling us. Yep. Because how they were telling I'm how they were telling me is like, what you're doing, stupid as fuck. Yep. You're gonna get hurt. Like, you're gonna get hurt. Man, I ain't gonna fucking get hurt. I've never been fucking hurt. You know, and so now it's 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 I think that that being able to translate those messages on what stupid shit is has become easier for people to do because maybe social media and all that other kind of stuff. So people are rising so much faster because they start earlier for one thing. True. You know, yep. So they start earlier. So their technique's good when they start to come into a, a decent age where they can get strong because mm. they figured the technique shit out when they were in high school or little after because a lot of lifters start young now really young yeah yeah you get to see more of that than i do mm -hmm. and then so they come in and they have that then they're not making the really dumb mistakes because right now they're seen as really stupid yeah you know and it's it's in a way it can be taken as an insult because it would be say there's an article saying don't do this 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 and this and you're like motherfucker i did all those things mm. but then when you step back you're like ah, yeah, you're probably right you don't want to do that that and that because i wouldn't have somebody do that now yeah right so a lot of those hurdles are being removed which allows the lifters to get better faster yep you know as well and so even uh, technology and information's there that wasn't a long time yeah ago. but that's still that's still that two and a half three year mark still hits yes it does now when it hits they're stronger than what we would have been when it hit. oh yeah without a doubt yeah. i mean could you imagine having the, all of this vast information at your fingertips when we were 23 i mean seriously mm -hmm. i mean it's it's mind-boggling now now, with that being said, would we, you and I, still be who we are at this point right now with that information? Probably not. You know, I think the path you took and the path I took probably benefited us better. That's just my old school mentality because you got to learn a lot of bad shit and a lot of good shit at the same time throughout your career. Well, the way I'd push back on that is, is I would say <clears throat> if, if we were to start it all over again now, if we were 18 or 20, we would have done exactly the same things that we did then if you break it down to what we really did. We experimented, tried to figure out what worked for ourselves. We looked at different types of periodization, tried to apply that to see how it would work. Mm. Take all the different types of periodization, blend it all into what works best for you or your individual or yep. your group. So what you did is we would do the same thing because you already, you already did it. Yeah. It's just now it would happen. It would happen at a faster rate. Right. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. instead of spending two and a half years doing block periodization, you might have been able to, you know, learn everything you need to know about it in a week. Yeah. And then run it for six months. And then you just maybe a year. Yeah. Maybe a year. Yeah. I, yeah. And I think that's that's the problem with too many people that you need to give that training methodology time. You know, and I don't, I, that's where I think a lot of people fall short nowadays is that they want that immediate success right then and there, but you got to give it, give it time. And it's just always been my opinion. I don't think people stay with it long enough. I think a good year on a program, you're going to know mm -hmm. uh, at least and not, not 12 weeks, not 28 weeks, nothing like that. I think it needs, you need a good solid year to at least get what? 12, 24, 36, 48, you probably get four good training cycles in a year. Yeah, you know what? I agree. The, um, cause I don't think that really has changed for the majority because uh, people still live in this fucking 12 to 16 week prep world. Yeah. Where that's what they do. Yeah. And so this is probably way more common than not, even with the, all the people that hire an online coach, they'll hire the online coach to prep. Right. Then they'll do their 12 week, 16 week prep. And then they don't use the coach anymore yep. until the next meet comes. So the next four months are just fucking worthless because that's when you actually really get strong. Yeah. Cause sometimes the prep you're doing now is for, for the next meet. Yes. And, and if they jump, yeah. so if that coach didn't work, they're going to go to this one. Yeah. You know, so that, that always happened though. Yep. That happened. 
back in powerlifting USA days that happened in I call it ebook days. So it's five thirty one <laughs> cube, you know. Right, so they're, yeah. they're they're jumping from program to program, not giving it a chance to really figure out what variables were helping and what ones weren't. Yep. That riddle I don't think has been solved. I don't I think, think that, it'll ever be solved. Yeah. I think that's still happening probably maybe even at a higher rate actually maybe even worse yeah because they're hiring somebody else to give it to them there's a lot of options out there yeah instead of the person actually trying to figure out you know what it is yeah um the other big part of that equation that i see kind of across the board your gym's different definitely way different is the same individuals will find a club to be able to train in for the meet then they're there for the six to eight weeks, meets over, you don't it. fucking see them again. Yep. And then you're like, oh, okay, so, you know, and so then after a few times, whatever crew or gym or whatever that was, they don't, like, don't come back. Yep. If you can't be here, yep. you know, when other people are doing their shit, yeah, but you can only you. come, yeah, when you can only come in when it's about you, yep. then get the fuck out. You know, I this agree. doesn't work this way. That kind of correlates with that too. So it's, the process has, a kind of talked my way through the process has become easier in some regards it has but the biggest hurdle i think is that yeah and they live in these fucking 12 week prep yeah you know, they, they really do there's more to it than just 12 weeks well i know that yeah i if, mean i know that you know that i mean i just the terminology like it's prep like what like a few years ago, somebody I'm, I'm in meat prep. I'm like, what the fuck is that? Yeah, what does that mean? What does that even fucking mean? And this is the first time I ever heard it was like yeah. four or five years ago. And I'm like, what the fuck is that? Like now you're in prep. Like what were you doing before? Yeah, isn't it all? You know that was a fucked up. Took me a while to figure out what they were talking about. Um, funny story on that one is it just came to my mind when I first came to Westside. I probably had 12 years of competing before that. And then Louie, we'd bench out at this other place. You know, it was Tim Van Horn's basically a barn in his backyard, right? <laughs> so we're, and there's three benches, kind of what you're talking about. There's, yep. you know, the weak bench, the middle bench, and the strong mm -hmm. bench. And so we're all in there benching. And then afterwards, we all start working up a little bit. And somebody said something about, you know, it was a PR. And I didn't know what a fucking PR meant. Because mm. to me, it, it has zero relevance. Because it was whatever, you, your lift was what you did in the meet. Everything else didn't mean shit. It was just training mm -hmm. to be able to get in there. And I had to ask, I think it was Tom Waddle, like, what, what, what? What's this PR thing? What the fuck is a PR? Yeah. It's like a personal record. I'm like, a personal record for what? <laughs> You know, for like the, I only thought the meat numbers matter. Yeah, for like a close grip two board. Yeah, and I'm like, what the fuck, huh? Yeah, and then you know, over time, like over the next month, I'm like, so we have like what fucking 400 PRs? Like, how can this be a P like a PR to me was like the, what you Just did in the the, fuck, meat. the main meat. Yeah, and, I, I remember those days. Yeah, and it was like it was so that was so fucking mm. confusing to me. Like, how in the fuck can everything be a PR? Because then it's then what's not a PR? Yeah. Like, I got, one, I got one more rep on pushdowns today. Is that a fucking PR? Yeah. I'm supposed to celebrate that? Yeah. What the, the well, fuck? I, I mean, you know, I agree with what you're saying. <laughs> um, the PRs for me are the, it definitely not accessory shit by mm -hmm. any means. What's I, I don't give a fuck about that. Um, but definitely, you know, main movement stuff, especially with our bands, especially with our boards, especially with the blocks. You know, stuff like that. Those are the only relevant things to me because I need to know what those were, what they're going to be, and what they they should be. Oh, yeah. Don't get me wrong. They matter. Yes, they they're, matter. They're, they're your indicators. They're, they're, yeah, they're an indicator yeah. of where you're at, you know, yeah. and every training cycle that you hit a new PR, that's progression. No matter how small it is, yes. that's progression. Well, to me, that's the, that's the number one metric on any program. If you it's damn good right or not, it is. Right, because if you can gauge where you are at any point in time, you know, based upon mm -hmm. indicator movements or whatever you yeah. want to call it. So reverse band or some people, maybe it's a floor press or yeah. floor press, whatever it is, you can gauge, even in the off season when you're doing all bodybuilding shit, there's certain things that are indicators. Oh, of course it is. Then no, you have to have those because yeah. if that falls under, you're like, motherfucker, I got to change some shit because this is too far under where i need to be exactly i agree right and it's um because it's i never called it meat prep but i call it like a starting line like there's a starting line say with you at the 12 weeks out with the band there's yep. a starting line mm -hmm. you need to be in a certain physical capacity in a certain shape 
to start that motherfucker. And that's why I said that is veteran lifter movement. You have to be established to start this. Yes. There has to be some kind of accreditation that you've gotten to to be at this point. Yeah, otherwise, it will tear you it apart. It will tear you apart. I can't throw my daughter Bethany in there on a fucking black band, and she can't even squat 200 pounds yet. Mm -hmm. You know? So what do you do there? Well... As of right now, we're still building a base strength with her. She's been training with us regularly now, I guess, uh, maybe eight months, something like that. And since then, she's put on almost 20 pounds of body weight, which, you know, she's, she's been 104, 105 pounds her entire life. So right now, she's getting past the point of trying to wrap her head around she weighs 123 pounds. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And that's where, you know, we're trying to make her understand, baby, you look healthier, you look better, you're more, you know, full, you're gaining muscle, you know, this is taking time. It's like with Bethany, we're not doing a lot of shit that we normally do with her. We are creating a basic strength curve right now to where I'm working her with just normal straight up weight, you know, mm -hmm. constantly. Um, we do do a little bit of band work on the squat and, and uh, like light band stuff just to give her a small overload. So basic progressive overload yes. with conditioning hypertrophy Yes. Work. So, you know, we're, we're, we're driving real slow with her right now mm -hmm. because I don't want to break her down. You know, I don't want her to get hurt, you know, and this is how I would do with anybody, you know, that's coming right out the gate. Um, I don't throw these people right into the fucking fire right out the gate because somebody's going to get fucked up, mm -hmm. you know, and it's going to, especially then it's going to, if they're not experienced enough, they're going to think in their mind, man, I can actually squat this. Yeah. Well, on a general <laughs> level, what does that look like? Because that could be a lot of people that are listening right now. Uh, explain what you're at. So on a general level, right? Because it's with your program, you have this base program, right? Mm -hmm. But it adjusts based upon the person in the day. Yeah. But, but here's this base. That doesn't mean that's what they do, but this is the base of what they optimally, if everything was perfect, that's what it would look like 12 weeks all the way through to the meet. But it never looks like that because it adjusts based upon all the other variables that are involved. So with what is the base for somebody that you're preparing to be able to get ready for that? Basically, you're preparing their you you are preparing them to train, to to train like real train. Yes, yes. <sighs> you're putting that, them. I, I, it's a hard it's a hard question to ask because there's so many variables that are different for each individual age, size, experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it, I can't just box it up into one answer. Mm -hmm. um, let's just keep talking about Bethany because she is our most uh, sure. Uh, so, she, all right, so she comes in day one yeah well i mean i'm just keeping everything basic you know it, it would be like let's just say like a 15 year old boy comes into our gym mm -hmm. let's say 16 let's say 16 comes into the gym wants to start training i am going to work with him exclusively on body movement only stuff right out the gate i'm not going to throw him under a fucking squat bar mm -hmm. i'm not going to have him deadlift and I need to understand what he's got going on, where he's at physically, what he can take, what he can do, what he's capable of. <clears throat> and I figure that's a good base starting. I think body movement movements, pull-ups, push-ups, that's some underrated shit right there. Mm -hmm. You get to learn a lot about a person if they can do a fucking pull-up or a push-up or if they can't. If they can't do those, how the hell am I going to put them under a squat bar? Mm -hmm. You know. So we got to get some base strength established first. That's what we're doing with Bethany. Even though she is in the middle of a training cycle, her training is not exactly close to what the other girls are doing, and it's purposely like that. The other thing that I have to put in consideration while I'm training her, I have to build confidence with what she's doing so she sees progression and she's not failing. I have a rule in the gym, and it's an almost, you know, you think, man, that's almost impossible to keep that rule. I refuse to have a lifter miss a lift during a training cycle for a meet. A mm -hmm. That shit's not happening. If it happens, it's only because we're just throwing a Hail Mary just to really see, you know. Um, for instance, 
uh, we were deadlifting the other day with a band. Zach pulled a massive deadlift PR. And I was thinking, man, that looked pretty good. Let's make, to me, a 10-pound jump is not really worth going yeah, after. Yeah. You understand yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, So let's try 20, and let's just see what happens. Well, he fucking shit the tank. Mm -hmm. Cause there's a lot of variables of why that could have been. But I needed to see. Mm -hmm, you know what I'm mm -hmm, saying? Mm -hmm. I needed to see. So with Bethany, I want to build confidence in her. I don't need her to to have a negative, I can't do this, I've missed this, I'm missing that, I'm not strong enough for this. And I also explained to her, like I do to new lifters when they come in, do not compare yourself to what they're doing. This is years and years and thousands and thousands of reps and time and effort that's put into what you're seeing. Do not compare yourself to this. You know, when Kristen came in, she wanted to absolutely right out the gate compete with Anika and Katie and Melissa. And I'm like, hold on, hold on, you know, give it some time. You're not ready for that yet. Let's get some shit established first. You know, let's, I don't want to throw you in there with these gladiators and you get mm -hmm. your fucking ass kicked and then your confidence goes down the shitter. So that's what I'm doing with Bethany. I'm just taking my time with her allowing her to see that she's growing, she's getting stronger, she is being successful, and as time maturates on, whenever that time is that I feel like, okay, it's ready, I don't know when that's going to be, but I'll know when it when I think that she's ready. It was the same with any of these people. When I feel like they're ready, then we'll get going. It's just something that I will call when I think that it's time. Can you recall any metrics that you would think that would let you know if they were right. I know that's a tough one because you. I know when you know, you know. I yeah, know, it, it's hard that. to put it into words. I, I'll answer this, but in a different aspect of what you're asking me. Every single lifter in my gym wants to lift in gear. I can say they don't, but they do. Everybody wants to lift in gear. It's funner, it's bigger, it's more weight, you know, blah, blah, blah. And you've heard me, you know this, that I have a prerequisite in my gym. You have to have a pro elite total raw before you ever touch gear. You have to have established strength, okay? I'm not letting some fucking guy in my gym that can only bench 200 pounds at 242 weight class raw get in a fucking shirt. Mm -hmm. What? And you've been here a year. <laughs> we got to get some established strength. We need to get some base. So all of them are aiming towards that elite total. That's what they want. They feel like, okay, I'm made. I've done this. I've accomplished this. Now I'm ready for the next thing, you know, or let's get another pro total in another weight class. If that, and I don't force anybody to get in gear. That's yeah. a choice. Um, but if they are continually hitting that pro total raw, let's drop to a weight class or let's go up a weight class. Let's start getting shit in multiple weight classes. I have several lifters sitting out here that's been four, five, three, four, five weight classes, each of them individually accomplishing different things. Um, but to get back to what you're saying, how do I know when somebody's ready to really throw them in the fire? It's, it's, it's so different for everybody. It's just something I know. I, I know this ain't the answer you want, but it's one of them. I'll know. I know when I'll know. Yeah, I know. I know. That's I've been doing this long enough that I know just by observing and watching that they are mentally ready to take that next step, you know? Um, but my job as their coach, and, and you may not like this answer and people may not like this answer, but it's my job to prevent failure because I want them to, I know that's, we can look at both sides of this. I want success at all times. I do not want missed lifts. You can look at the record of any of my lifters in my gym. Bombs is an absolute rarity. Melissa has one. Shelly has one. Dylan has one. And I think that's it. Well, let me throw back. Would you let them start if they were not technically sound on the list? Fuck lips? no. Okay. Would you let them start if they weren't able to bench their body weight, squat twice their body weight? Now. I know there's variances there yeah. for the women. So we'll put Melissa in this. 
Melissa's first meet, 105, 55, 185. She was not ready for real training. She just was not physically, her body was not physically ready for it. So I continued to work with her until she got to some numbers that I thought, okay, if she can get to a 200-pound squat, if she can get to a 110-pound bench, if she can get to a 225 pull, all of these raw, I feel like now she has some established strength at that weight, let's say at 123, 132. She's continued to grow. She's gotten stronger. I can see the development. Now it's now she's ready. Yeah. I guess if you want to look at it like that, I don't think I've ever looked at it like twice the body weight. Of I'm just throwing shit and out. And that's a good yeah, way. Yeah. 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 And that's probably a great way of looking at it. I'm not about just your body weight unless you weigh 242. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in her case, once she got double her body weight on a couple of the lists, I mean, you're rarely going to see a woman bench double their body weight right out the gate. Yeah. You know, but on the squat and deadlift, I guess that was a good metric right there. I didn't realize maybe yeah. I used that until you just said that, but that's a good metric. Well, to there's going to be a strength metric. There's going to be a te technique metric. There's yeah. going to be a mental metric, and mm -hmm. there's going to probably be a consistency metric. Right now with Bethany and new lifters, we practice techniques so much. We don't video our lifts to show off. We're videoing them because we're looking at them as soon as we lift to break down what we're doing. You know what I'm saying? The good, the bad, the right, the wrong. We are constantly honing our technique. I, I mean, I've been doing this 29 years, and I'm still working on my technique. They have watched me lift like I have watched them lift. I need feedback when I'm done. Was my speed good? Was my elbows here? Was my feet doing this? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Um, that's another metric that's involved when I feel like that those things are starting to get locked in. Cause I feel like that's the most important shit is your technique right out the gate. Yeah. Um, then we can start taking another step, you know, Bethany hasn't gotten to that, but, but I mean, she's still fresh. She's yeah, still new. Yeah, it's going to yeah. take time. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's never going to be a point that you're never working on your technique because that's the key to everything. 99% of the time, and I say that it's a high ratio, if you, I won't say everybody else, but if we miss a lift, it's because of technique. Mm -hmm. It sure as fuck ain't about strength, because oh, I'm yeah. not putting them out there to make lifts that they are not physically ready to take. Yeah, I would say that's most of the time. Yeah. Now, I've seen a lot of ego lifting in my damn time. People opening with dumb shit and taking stupid jumps, and you know what I'm talking mm -hmm, about. Mm -hmm. We don't do that. That's why I don't let them make any calls. I make the calls mm -hmm. because they're a lifter. You know how emotional you are and stressed out. and Well, you don't up. see yourself lifting the meat either. Exactly. I right? do. Yeah. And I've watched you thousands of times. Mm -hmm. I know what you're ready for and what you're not. I've seen you miss a lift and come back and make it. Or should you make this jump? Or was that this? Or was you leaning forward? Or was your feet not in? Or you know what I'm saying? You know, I know those things. That's why they don't make any of the calls. I make all the calls. I've tried to put all of my lifters in a winning situation at all times. At all times. I like to tell them I'm not playing checkers. I'm playing chess. I want to fucking win. Has there ever been a time where you thought you were done? As a coach or as a lifter? As a lifter. I'm not going to lie, Dave. When I tore my ACL out here that time, I thought I was done. I did. That I'd never taken a devastating injury like that. Um, you know, I went ahead and finished coaching that entire weekend, and every professional that you had in here thought, "Man, you're okay. It's not that bad. It's okay." Well, the stupid me. Melissa knows this. I competed the next weekend after that happened. I was preparing for a bench only me, and what happened to me when I was training here was my fucking fault. I did something that I should not have done. It was nobody's fault but mine. And when it happened, I knew it was me. It was me, and it was a technique thing. I competed the next week, still not knowing what is exactly wrong with my knee, and I about got myself fucking killed at that meet. I did. I was locking the weight out with my left arm, but because I couldn't drive this knee, it dumped in my face twice, and it's a wonder I didn't get killed at that meet. So finally, my dumb ass went to the doctor, and uh, 
we got x-rays of course you got to go through that then we get the mri and they're like do you do you realize what's wrong with your knee I, it just fucking hurts man well your patella is cracked your acl is torn your mcl's torn both meniscus are torn you have bone cartilage that is broken off in your knee. You know, they just kept giving these lists of everything that was wrong with my knee. And I was like, Jesus Christ, what? Mm -hmm. They told me and Melissa that this was going to be a one day outpatient surgery. I was in the hospital three days. I've got four titanium screws in my knee right now and all kinds of other shit. I never thought I was going to come back from that. I didn't. I, it was just such a devastating injury to me, to me, because I'd never had something like that. You know, that's really, you know, as well as I do, coming back from something like that is a battle. Mm -hmm. Because then when you come back from it, you're fucking thinking about it the whole time. Every time you lift, is it going to hold up? Is it going to bust? Am I going to tear it up again? Am I going to fuck this up again? Am I going to get hurt again? Yeah, I was that person. I'll never forget when I got released out of the hospital, we were having this conversation three days later. I woke up. I didn't know I was still in the fucking hospital. It's three days later. They was like, man, your knee was so fucked up. It took a while to get this shit back together. We get to the house. We're in Melissa's little ass Honda Accord. I'm 317 with a fucking reconstructed leg. Practically. I can't even get out of the car. We had to call somebody to pick me up physically out of the car and carry me into the house, you know, but I thought I was done at that point. And then here we are three days later, I'm in fucking rehab at the facility after a surgery. They, they came by the house the next day and brought me the uh, CPM machine. Mm -hmm. You know, they're constantly moving your knee up and down, you know, try to get to that 90 degree. I was miserable. I'd never been in that much pain in my life. And then three or four days later, she can answer this better than I can. They're wanting me to hold on to this railing and take a step. Tears just rolling down my eyes. I was in so much fucking pain. I never thought I was going to make it back. And it took me, it took me two years, two years to realistically handle weight that I can handle. I'm not the best squatter in the world, but I mean, I did squat 930 at 46 years old, um, but it took me forever. And that doctor told me, he said, Joey, you're never, ever going to squat heavy again. There is just way too much shit that's going on right here. And I'm that dumbass. You're not going to tell me I can't do something. I just want to prove you wrong. And if I die trying, then it's so be it. But my first meet back after that was my third meet full power that I ever did in my life. I squatted 900 pounds. And I forgot my squat shoes. I did that in Air Jordan tennis shoes. And my toe got broke the week before because the lifter at the gym dropped the glute ham raise on my fucking foot. They all know this. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Jesus Christ. Um, but that's, I thought I was done after that because it took so long for me to get back. Two years is a long time, man, to keep grinding, you know, to keep grinding and the rehab that they put me through. I mean, it was like six months of just constant, you know, and the pain, the, this shit sucked, man. I mean, it sucked. But yeah, that was the one time I thought it was over with. And then, I'm not forgetting to add this in, eight months after the surgery, I decided it would be a great idea to compete and do a deadlift only meet. My second attempt, I tore my bicep. Mm -hmm. Just after surgery on my knee. So I had both of those factors going on. At the same time, and I was, I, I, I'm not going to sit here and lie. I almost said, fuck this. I had two major injuries to me at the same time going on mm -hmm. and two surgeries. And it was brutal. I mean, it was brutal. I was hobbling around on a knee with a fucking arm brace on with my bicep. All right. So where I'm getting at here is, so in your brain, you're saying, fuck this, but yet you're still going in and training. Because I'm not a quitter. So I love, I yes. love this shit. I do. I do. So I, I think the lesson there is you don't always are going to like it. You just got to mm. keep doing it. Cause I think that's where some people fall off. Right. Because you obviously you didn't in, fucking enjoy going in during that whole time. Cause half your, half the time you're thinking I'm fucking done. Mm. The other half the time you're like, no, I'm going in. Yeah. 
so that battle plays out for a while. <sighs> this gets me emotional talking about it. And I feel like an idiot because I've never seen anybody get upset on a podcast, but I have watched my family be failures and I never wanted to be that person. I didn't want to quit. I didn't want to give up. And um, I'm just too fucking hard-headed just to quit. And I love this. I, I have so much passion for this sport and my team that if I quit, what does that, how does that look to them? I just can't do it. I can't quit. And I apologize for acting like this. I feel like a fucking idiot, but this means more to me than what people understand. This is not a hobby. This is part of my life. This is who I am. And for some people, they can say, man, that's so stupid. This shouldn't define you. It does define me. This is who I am. This is what I love. This is what I do. Nobody has the passion for this sport the way I do. I want to give. I want to help. I want to see people succeed. And I can't be a leader to these people if I am a quitter. And that's not what I fucking am. So, take that as, as it is. What I'll push back at you on this is, <laughs> right, is... You as a lifter doesn't determine you as a coach to the people that you're coaching. No, it doesn't. But you're, my, you're convoluting that. No, but your actions can inspire people to become better and more than what they are by what you can do. If they don't think that they can do it, but you can. Then that would mean Nick Saban would have to be playing ball. Not necessarily because he's not a football player. I'm a lifter and a coach. He's mm -hmm. not a football player and a coach. He's only a coach. I'm doing two things at the same time. He's doing one. There's well, no comparison. But what I'm saying is to the people that you coach, yeah. the one thing matters way more than the other. You as a coach matters to them way more than you as a lifter. True, but sometimes you have to lead by example, and I hope to God that I have somewhat inspired my teammates in some way, shape, or form of overcoming the things that I have overcome. So in case these obstacles ever happen to them, they see that you can overcome it. You can beat it. You can do it. You know what I'm saying? That's what I hope. I hope that I've inspired them enough, not only as a coach, but as a lifter. They watch me. They see me. I want to inspire them not just as their coach, but also as a lifter. I'm 49 years old. I've been fucking competing for 29 years. How many people in this goddamn sport can say that at, at a level? Oh, I, I get that, but what I'm saying, and you can ask all your team, mm -hmm. is you're combining two things, Yeah. right? And But you know what a lot of them do? Basically, what I'm doing right now is I'm calling you out on your bullshit. Right. You're right. self justifying your wanting to compete and push the limits that you compete as a way of not just saying, I'm doing this because this is what I fucking love mm -hmm. to do. It is. And saying, I'm doing this because they need me to do that. And you I know, I didn't say that they needed. That's bullshit. I have several people sitting back here and you can see them. Ask any of them how much they enjoy watching me compete because of the rarity of it. They don't need it, though. They don't need it. They don't need it. They don't need it. But I still need it because there are things that I still want to do. And I like proving to them that you don't yes. put an age on this. Yeah. Don't put limitations on yourself. Don't use this fucking petty ass excuse that you have. You can push through things if you really want to, mentally, physically. They all inspire me. Melissa has Crohn's. Dylan has fucking uh, um, diabetes. Anika has liver disease. You know, I could keep going. There are people that have things way worse than what I do, 
And because of what they do in their everyday life and in the gym and on the platform inspires me. So you don't think that I'm not inspiring them with my little things that I'm doing. It goes both ways. I see the things and the obstacles that they deal with working spousals, women, trouble, health problems, money, finance. There's all kinds of things. You understand this. Mm -hmm. There's lots of obstacles that everybody's dealing with. But each of them, and I know their stories, when I see them go out on that platform and perform and overcome those problems and have success, that inspires the shit out of me. It does. Do they have to do that to do that for me? No, but it still inspires me. So you don't think it doesn't work the other way around? No, I don't. Mm. Ask them that. Yeah. Because yes, it will motivate them, but let me let me push this to a different level. Cut. All right, let's say if if you were in a position to where you kept doing what you were doing, and you're not, so I'm not insinuating this at all. Mm. That you were doing what you're doing, it would it would kill you. They don't want you dead; they want you as a coach. And I'm not saying that's the case, right? Right. So if what you're saying to taken to the extreme is no, I need to do this to die so they can see that I'm willing to I do this to die. I didn't say that. No, but if you take it to the extreme of what I'm saying. Now, I could use that for any of them. Any of them could get killed on the platform. Well, I'm not speaking the weights and stuff like that. Because that losing weight, all that other stuff that you're doing for your longevity now. Yeah. Right? So you could have just said, fuck it. Right. And just kept pushing at that higher weight. Right. <clears throat> yeah. To be able to do that. They don't want to see that. You know, you don't want to see that. So you lost weight. So you're being able to be healthy. Right. So if let's say this gets worse over a period of time and you have to weigh 200 pounds. Well, you're, you're throwing a lot of what ifs and what mights. Mm -hmm. I know that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But what the point I'm trying to make is. I think you're putting too much emphasis on what you have to do as a coach on a platform relates to them. And it does. It certainly does. I saw it with Louis. Mm -hmm. It fucking totally matters. But I also saw Louis still create champions after he could no longer compete anymore. So let me explain something to you. They know this. My priorities in my powerlifting career have changed dramatically, meaning that their success is more priority of mine. If I retire tomorrow, I'm good with what I have done in this sport. I am. I'm 100% okay with what I've done. Can anybody sit back and look back and say, man, I wished I'd have squatted this. Man, I wished I'd have benched that. Man, I wished I'd have deadlifted that. Of course. I don't think any of us are ever going to be satisfied with any fucking meat or any fucking number we ever do because you always want more. Always. Mm -hmm. All right? They know that my especially my older lifters. It's not about me anymore. It's not, I'm not priority. This meat that I just did, you want to know the last meat I did two years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay. I pick and choose what I want to do when I think that I'm physically ready to handle something. When did that priority shift happen? Cause that's a big thing. 10 years ago. That's easy. Why? Because I wanted to start infusing myself into these individuals more. I wanted to create something that I've always wanted, a real team, a successful team, a winning team, and let's be honest, a family. That's what we are. We're a family. I have focused on their priorities, their success. They're all sitting here. They're not going to lie. I don't make them say shit. I have sacrificed a lot of myself so they win, so they succeed. I have put my wants and needs back because I don't feel like I have to prove anything anymore. But it's it, No, it's, I get that. It's it's hard to just give up the itch. You cannot tell me deep down there's still not a piece of you that would love to go out and squat a fucking grand if you could. Well, you'll see stupid shit I do tomorrow to validate that. It's just, well, there you it's, go. It never goes away. Right. It never goes away. It never goes away. Yes. So. But you answered what I was looking for. 
you know, if that priority is not first, but it's shifted for theirs to become first, that transition. But they'll all tell you when I compete, they don't want to compete when I compete oh, because I they want to watch me yeah. perform. I don't disagree with that at all. Yeah. Because it's, I strongly feel if I didn't do the stupid shit that I do out here occasionally. Yeah. People need to see that. That train, you know, that train out here. They need to be able to see, like, what the fuck is... So how's that any different than me? It's competing? not. That's what I'm saying. It's not. Yeah. But the, <clears throat> it's not my main priority. So you're that's doing not, two things at once. Exactly. Exactly. Right? But the priority <laughs> is not me. Right? The yeah, priority, it's definitely not me. Right? So it's, it's... I'm doing it for two reasons. Yeah. True. You know, I agree with that. But it's, it's a big shift for a lifter to go from lifter to coach. And make that priority change. Not if. Well, you it, know it's a big shift because we've seen is, so many people that can't do it. it. It is, but I think it would, it's, and there's a lot of variables in this answer as well. If you are a lifter that did not ever accomplish the things that you wanted to, and you were, you had some voids that were missing, whether it was injuries, bad days, shit in life that, took place regret it's a little bit harder to shift over to that because you're going to keep thinking in the back of your mind what if well if you shift over to that too you're going to try to live vicariously through that yeah and that's not what i do because yeah. i feel look i'm not the best lifter in the world i've not benched the most deadlifted the most what i have had over a lot of people is tenure in this sport at a high level I mean, there's not a lot of people that's competing at 29 fucking years and still hitting PRs. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that proves that our system works. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And that we're still getting it done. But again, the priority is not me. It hasn't been for a long time, and all of them know that. You know, I want to see them succeed. I want to see, like, the boys in my gym, they want to beat my number so fucking bad they can't stand it. We talk about it all the time. That's why that board's in there. I want you to beat me. I want you to beat me. I want you to be the better version of me. I want you to do what I haven't done. The coaching aspect, I guess the point that I'm saying is what I'm trying to get to or what I'm trying to figure out is how you've made that tr transition while so many others can't because I'm pretty uh, confident in what I've done in my career. I'm happy with it. I could have retired 10 years ago and I'd still be happy with it. I would have, but I'm not at that. I still have fight in me. I still have the ability right now. I haven't had two hip replacements. I haven't had two shoulder replacements. I haven't had two knee replacements. You know, I haven't had those debilitating things happen yet. May I be in line for that one day? Probably. I wouldn't change a fucking thing about it. If it happens, it happens. It is mm -hmm. what it is. Those are the sacrifices and shit you deal with. But I have, I feel good about my career, not just as a lifter, but as a coach, what I feel like I have given back to this sport the things we have done in our community as a gym are fucking awesome. You know what we did at our high school? Yeah. And there still is a ton of pride in that with what we did. We didn't have to do that. Those things all come together cumulatively for my career. My bench just does not make who I am and what I've done in the sport or my deadlift. I look at everything as its as its entirety of what I've done. Well, let me let me. Throw so it this was at. easy for yeah, me yeah. to focus more on them. So let me circle to this question then, because you don't make your living on this sport. The Fuck gym no. the gym probably costs you money. It doesn't make you money. <laughs> it right? does cost the me money. The sport costs you money. You're not an online coach. You, you don't have e and you I don't, don't have, charge them. You don't for charge my them, so you don't have any of that. Right? None of it at all. So why give back to the sport? Why is it important for you to give back to the sport? Man, that's a that's a long answer. When I when I started, 
I have been blessed in so many ways, the people that I have met in my journey throughout my lifting career, starting when I was 15 years old. To sum it up as shortly as possible, nobody ever asked anything from me. No money, nothing. They gave me their time. They gave me their knowledge. I have traveled all over these United States. I have stayed at people's houses just to learn from them. I have traveled to their facilities just to learn from them. I have spoken to people just to learn from them. You know what I'm saying? And soak up all of this knowledge, all of these things that I possibly have, and not one person has ever turned me down, turned me away. Never. They've always given and given and given. So why would I not give it back to somebody else? You know, a couple of guys said a long time ago, I said it in a podcast a long time ago, that a couple of guys said, remember, Joey, one day you might be us or be better than us. And remember, what we are giving you, you give this back because somebody showed us and you just pass it on. Again, live, learn, pass on. And I feel like that's what I'm doing. That's what you do. I'm just doing it in a different sort of light. You know, you give away free content constantly on your site. But what's your reason why? Like, I know my reason why, because powerlifting changed my life. But what's your reason why? Well, I mean, I could say that answer, but is that going to be good enough? I mean, powerlifting is my life. Outside of my family, you know, what do you mean, sa it, it saved my life. How? Well... There's a lot of people sitting here that knows how I used to be and who I used to be. I was pretty much heading on a path of destruction because I was not always just the good guy that I am now. And it gave me an outlet to focus my energy elsewhere instead of doing the dumb shit that I was doing. It, it gave me an outlet to, I hate to say this because I wasn't on the streets, but to get off the streets, you know, it's like a YMCA for kids in a fucked up neighborhood. It's giving them an outlet and a place to go to turn that negative energy that you're doing out here inside of here. You know, uh, the same for me. Uh, I, I don't really want to get into all of my personal life, but I was going to go to prison or I was going to die because of the lifestyle that I was living for such a long time. And people kept drawing me back into the gym, you know, and giving me and helping me and showing me. I was still friends with the people that I was running around with, but I wasn't doing the things that was going to get me in trouble that they were still doing because I was being preoccupied. It's like kids in high school being involved in sports. It's keeping them occupied to not venture off into dumb shit as much. Sports occupies the kids. It gives them something else to do to turn negative into positive energy. It teaches them responsibilities and lifelong lessons. Powerlifting has been no different. It's teaching, it's, it's given me friends that I've had for decades, you know, 30 years, people that I've known and met and that have given and given and given to me. That's all that I'm doing is giving back to these people and helping them because maybe I'm just really a good guy and I want to see people succeed in life. Sometimes the answer is just as simple as that. I just want to see these people succeed and I feel like I can help them. And I think that I have, but they have also helped me. You know, they've helped me in life. And without powerlifting, these people sitting behind me and you sitting in front of me would never have happened. I would probably be dead or in prison right now. But here I am with Dave Tate on a podcast in London, Ohio, at the baddest motherfucking gym in the world with my entire team sitting behind me. That's pretty fucking cool. Did you ever imagine that? No. No. Nope. So then how does that make you feel? <laughs> Pretty good. From where you were. Because they're all sitting there. Things could have been much different. Things could have been much different. 
things could have been much different. These are things that <clears throat> I can't help from where I come from, but I can surely control where I'm going. <clears throat> and I'm not proud of, you know, it's like we were talking about with Daniel, his story. My shit is no different. Rough, rough family. Alcoholics, drug use. I've never met my real father. My mom's, you know, drugs, alcohol, child abuse. I never thought I was going to make it past 11. You know, once I got in my 20s, I never thought I'd see 30, you know. But because of this sport, and my dad getting me involved with those concrete weights on that front porch in our little hometown when I was 12 years old started this. And other people that I would meet each year, different places, continually helping me and showing me and being good to me kept leading me back to this sport, you know, and... I couldn't be more grateful. I didn't get here because of just what I've done. There has been a lot of people involved in getting Joey Smith to where he's at. I cannot take any of the credit. Yeah, I, I've got to do this and I've got to do that, but there's been a lot of people. I mean, you've helped me a lot. You know, I remember sitting and talking to you years ago. I still have the email when you remember when the old uh, powerlifting forums were still around. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I know. What you know what about. I'm talking yeah. about. And these fucking people were killing me, mm -hmm. killing me. And that old Joey kept coming out. You know, I was ready to fight every goddamn buddy, hunt these fucking people down and kill everybody because I was so fucking mad. And you just kept talking to me and messaging me, you know, bringing my ass back down temperamental wise. Calm down. Let this shit be. Don't waste your energy on it. Because if you wasn't doing something, they wouldn't be talking about you in the first fucking place. They mm -hmm. would give anything to be where you're at right now. But I didn't see that at the moment. But you helped me see that. You know, I'm appreciative to you more than you know. I've always taken pride in being a part of this company. It's always meant a lot to me. But I never thought that I'd be right here. Never. This sport has opened so many doors for me and made so many lifelong friendships. It's just, it's, it's mind-boggling to sit back and think about it. It's mind boggling. When, <clears throat> when we brought you on and when I brought other people on, <clears throat> you know the vision, the aim of the company, right? Powerlifting changed my life. Yep. You know? So when I bring and brought people on, I'm bringing them on to be aspirational to other people, right? So, hey, I want to bench 800 pounds. Or right. here's this guy chasing 800 pounds, you know? And it, it, was a, it was a journey. There's no doubt about that. Yes, so, again, was. that was a fucking one fun to watch. Yeah. Aggravating, fun, frustrating, <laughs> as you just said, but fun to watch. Yep. <clears throat> but at the same time, it's looking for people that I was, that I was trying to think of, will people at some point in time look up to them for reasons more than that? Right. Because when you came on, you were an, an athlete. Yeah. You're a bencher. Right. So if I look at this live, learn, pass on, right, you're like in the learning phase, the living phase, you know, mm -hmm. right in there. And now I'm sitting here speaking to a person that's got 20 people or whoever fucking sitting behind you that's part of your fucking team, you know, that has grown to be a coach. So when I look at that live, learn, pass on, it's gone from me, it's gone to you. And it will go to them. And then somebody out there will be you someday. You know, that's, that's, that circle. Yep. You know, that it changed me. It changed you. It will change them. And then they will change somebody else. You know, so as long as people can keep that vision in mind with the sport of powerlifting and not fucking monetize every fucking piece of it it will continue i agree when that starts fracturing which we've seen happen and we get frustrated about that yes the reason we get so frustrated about that is because we're not seeing we're seeing that chain being broken yeah because that younger joey couldn't afford a coach right yeah 
you know, so if those people weren't around, what, what happens? Right. If that first group wasn't around, what happens? Yeah. You know, that there's so many different places to where that can all fracture because of monetization. Yeah. You know, and so to me, it's awesome to sit and see that you have a gym that's free. You know, everybody can come, they got to earn it. Yeah. They don't just get there for free. Right. It's that, that what they got to do is more than what if they just had to pay fucking 40 bucks a month. Yep. Way harder. It's so way easier to pay 40 fucking bucks a month than to actually become part of a team, grow with the team and become part of your brand. You know, you're calling the brand's bad word culture, culture, yeah. your culture, you know? So on my end, that's seeing something that I wanted to try to cultivate actually happening which is when i look at all the all you guys you know it's it's there and it will it continue with your people out there i have no doubt it will because of everything you just sat here and said yeah over this whole last period of time you know you're making them more than lifters you're taking all the values that we learned in the gym that made you graduate from college Hmm. that made you be successful in the careers that you've been in yeah all those things those are of more value than the plates on the bar we yes. we know that yeah, we, we know, know that. that right mm-hmm. but the plates on the bar are fucking awesome they and we're never going to lose sight of that no, sir. Right? you know so even if someday you don't compete i guarantee and will guarantee fucking to you a hundred fucking times over you will find a way to go in the gym and fucking strength yes sir you most that because i know that it doesn't go away Mm-mm. right that's in your fucking eyes it's in your blood it's all that other kind of stuff so to me that's I can't express my gratitude for that because not everybody does that. You've seen it. Yeah. All right. And at the same time we've seen, I've seen people I never thought was going to do that. Do it. Yeah. Other people I thought 100% they're doing it end up being fuck ups right you <laughs> oh, know yeah. it's, it's it's crazy looking back because it it's, it's like two decades man it's like yeah. holy fuck you know <clears throat> but i was with a lot of you guys i was pretty close you know you just don't know it yet i'm 10 years you know i'm ahead you yeah. know I'm, I'm years ahead you know so you can kind of see the character and the traits the same way that you're seeing it in the lifters that you have there um any other topics that you wanted to talk about that I didn't Jesus bring up? Jesus Christ. <laughs> I would like to say happy birthday to my daughter, Caitlin. Her birthday was yesterday, and uh, that's a that's another big deal to me, which you already know all that. But she turned 23 yesterday, and yeah. <laughs> Normally at this point, I would say if people wanted to follow you, you know, to go to your Instagram, but it's private, <laughs> right? <laughs> it is. Um, it is. Um, we do have a, a Nebo Barbell Facebook page, and that's where I promote all these people behind me. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I uh, post all their training videos, all their meat videos. Also, I do that on Instagram and and I do that on my Facebook page. I I'm a little bit different with social media obviously because I keep keep it private. Um I don't need or want all of that attention, you know, from the rest of the world. Um by me keeping it private, I can control what I want and who I want, a part of our life, our team, our success what we do um i don't need a bunch of damn followers to make me feel validated or to show off or any of that shit i don't care about those things but our our team facebook page team nebo Barbara facebook facebook page is um it's not private it's public Mm -hmm. it can be seen so i mean i do get messages on there i can be messaged through there you know I can be sent Facebook or Instagram messages just because it's not public does not mean that you cannot contact me, but everything is under Nebo barbell, except my, my personal Facebook uh, page is Joey Smith, but everything else is under Nebo barbell. 
All right. Anybody wants to contact him, that's his stuff. Thank you for coming out. Yes, Thank sir. Thank you for representing the brand. And we're done. All right. The Swiss Symposium 2023. Yes, we are bringing this back to Columbus again. The date is October 20 and 21. Columbus, Ohio, Hilton, it's the same location it was last year. If you head over to the website, there's a big banner that links directly to Swiss. There's also a link in the description box so you can see who the presenters are as we are booking them for the symposium. The symposium has been going on for 20 years. It's, in my opinion, probably a little biased, but in my opinion, one of the best symposiums when it comes to strength and conditioning, uh, sport medicine, therapy, physical therapy. Right now, the admission is 38% off or 48% off. It's I'm don't know. I'm not looking. I'm just kind of looking at the camera right now, but it's the early, early, early bird rate. That rate is until July 1st. So now is the best time for you to sign up. When you go to register, there's three different ways that you can res register for the symposium. There's the general admission, which gets you into all the different lectures that you want to go to. The caveat is there's three or four lectures going on at the same time. So the second option allows you to purchase the videos of all the lectures for you to be able to watch at a later time. So that allows you and gives you access to everybody that's presenting if there's two people presenting at the same time that you would really like to see. The format that those are in is, it's a streaming service. So it's, it's if you've ever purchased a training course from anybody before, it's very similar to that. So you log in and then there's all the presentations that are there. You just click, you watch, you stream. It's how it works. The third option is the VIP option. And included in that is the Sunday after the symposium, a limited number of people will be coming out to our gym, the S5 compound at Elite FTS with a handful, maybe a little bit more of the presenters that are there just to train, to hang out, have some barbecue, have a good time. And that again is limited on the attendance. It's already 50% sold out or 50% of the spots left depending on how you want to look at it, go to the link in the description. We'll have more information about the Swiss throughout the podcast. As we move forward, we have a lot of the presenters booked for the podcast. So we'll be talking more about it. We'll see you there. As I want to call out the limited edition apparel, the link is in the description. As I spoken about before, the limited edition apparel is apparel that I basically come up with. So some of the designs suck, some of them not so much. It's a weird thing. The ones that I think are gonna do really well usually don't. The ones that I think aren't gonna do really well, do really well. Either way, they're all limited runs, so it changes you know, every single month. But all limited edition items are tri-blend material with you know the cut that everybody wants now that's a little bit tighter on their arms so they can show off how big their fucking arms are. The limited edition items, directly support the podcast. So head over, pick up your shirt today. Could be a hoodie, could be shorts. We got these ball hugger shorts right now, which I would never wear, but I was told they were super popular, but you know what? They were wrong because they're still sitting there and I probably should discount them right now. Anyhow, if you want to see the discount on the ball hugger shorts, head over, over to the limited edition apparel link in the description box.